but Yankee Stadium hasn't seen a World Series since 1981. Tonight, another October start for David Cohn. Another national stage for the emerging star, Bernie Williams. Another crack at the World Series for Paul O'Neill, whose Cincinnati Reds won it six years ago. And for Wade Boggs, whose Red Sox were one pitch away a decade back. In their first ever postseason game, the Texas Rangers hand the ball to John Burkett, a Florida Marlin, only two months ago. It's an overdue national stage for young stars Juan Gonzalez, 47 homers this year. And Ivan Rodriguez, who soon will pick up his fifth consecutive gold glove. And for playoff experience, there's the former giant Will Clark. The Rangers and the Yankees, game one, next. NBC Sports presents... The American League Division Series. Tonight, it's game one. The Texas Rangers versus the New York Yankees. A sellout crowd, of course, on a perfect October night for baseball in the Bronx, and it will be raucous here for game one between the Yankees and the Rangers. Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Costas. I'll be joined shortly by Joe Morgan and Bob Uecker, and we'll tell you all about these two teams. But the big story continues to be the situation surrounding the umpires and Roberto Alomar. You'll recall this past weekend in Toronto, Alomar spat in the face of umpire John Hirschbeck. American League President Gene Budig handed him a five-game suspension. The umpires thought, A, that was too lenient. B, with Alomar appealing, and with the suspension only applying to regular, not postseason games, he will not have to sit out any games, at least if this ruling stands, until April, and it's possible with an appeal that the uh, suspension could be reduced from five games to something less. The umpires threatened not to work the games earlier today. They came this close. In fact, they didn't show up at the ballpark in Baltimore till just a few minutes before the scheduled game time. But regular umpires did work in Baltimore and in St. Louis this afternoon. There is a hearing scheduled for Thursday, an expedited hearing on the Alomar situation, and that is the crux of the problem right now. Let's go to Jim Gray as this story continues to develop. He's downstairs at Yankee Stadium. All right, thank you very much, Bob. That is indeed the problem right now. Richie Phillips, who is the head of the umpires union, just arrived here at Yankee Stadium. He ordered the umpires not to take the field because he does not have a site for the meeting on Thursday. Now, we have a time, 10 o'clock. Rich Levin of Major League Baseball tried feverishly to get a hold of Bud Selig or somebody who could confirm a site. Gene Budig, who is the president of the American League, Mr. Budig is here in the stadium. However, he had been traveling all day and doesn't know where the site is. Richie Phillips is emphatic. He will not have his umpires take the field right now until he has a site picked out. He says it is a breach of the agreement, and if he doesn't have that agreement in hand, there will be no reason for these umpires to get out on the field. Now, I talked to Crew Chief Jim Evans. He believes it will be just a matter of minutes as they are inside the siding right now what to do. He doesn't believe that this game is in peril. However, it could take some time for the proper authorities to get in contact with one another to work this out. Bob? All right, Jim, thanks a lot. Joe and Bob join me. The start of today's game in Baltimore, the first of today's three playoff games, was delayed a few minutes. Uh, the replacement umpires supposedly were on hand, though no one ever really saw the amateur umpires, and so they had to delay it a little bit as the regular umpires got there only a few minutes before the scheduled game time, and it appears we'll have another delay here. Before we can get the comments of these gentlemen, <laughs> Jim Gray tells me in my ear that he has more information. Back down to Jim. Well, they've just resolved part of it. It will take place at the American League office here in New York Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Rich Levin just gave us that information. Rich Levin, the PR director for Major League Baseball. However, Richie Phillips is still in right now talking to his crew, and he believes that uh, they have been kind of fussed around with and really haven't lived up to the agreement, so it looks as though we're going to have some type of a symbolic delay. Bob? Well, this is the question. Suppose they have this hearing on Thursday, and Budig rejects the appeal but allows the original sentence to stand, which is five regular season games to be served next April. You, I gotta believe the umpires are not gonna be satisfied with that. They want Alomar to sit out at least some games in the postseason. Well, I think that's right, Bob, and I totally agree. You know, uh, it's something that's an ugly incident, and we've seen it a number of times, and uh, we've seen it too many times, as a matter of fact. But uh, the suspension of five games next season, to me, is awfully light. I thought the suspension should have taken place immediately, and for the next game, the game that he had a home run, that incidentally won the game for the Orioles and won the uh, the wild card spot. But uh, to to pop him with five games for next year 
to me is 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 much too short. Um, I'm even talking about playoff games this year. I mean, it wouldn't have bothered me at all had Alomar been uh, been punished by uh, by being eliminated from some of these uh, these division games. On the other hand, no matter how severe the offense, baseball's agreement with the Players Association does provide for an appeal process. And when Alomar said he was going to appeal the five games and they couldn't arrange something quickly enough, the league found itself caught in a bind, or at least so they say. Well, I think they are caught in a bind because the appeal process is part of the bargaining agreement. But I think it's going to happen this Thursday. Is I talked to Jerome Holtzman, who is a Hall of Fame sports writer from the Chicago Tribune. Just on my way up, Bob. He says to me that they're going to suspend Roberto Alomar for the last part of the series with the Cleveland Indians, and maybe even more, but expect him to miss the game on Friday. When you say the last part, Thursday is an off day. Right. Tomorrow is another game in Baltimore. Then there would be as many as three games, depending upon how the series goes in Cleveland. Are you, are you saying they believe he'll miss one or miss the remainder of the series? I believe he'll miss the remainder of the series and maybe even more, but at least the remainder of the series with the Cleveland Indians. More developments from Jim Gray. He is with the American League Executive Director of Umpires, Marty Springstead. Let's go downstairs. All right, Bob, we're joined by Marty Springstead. Marty, can you tell us what's going on with Richie Phillips and his crew right now and what's being discussed? You just left the room. Oh, well, they're discussing whether they should work or delay the game a while uh, to make sure the meeting is scheduled, as, as said, uh, and they needed a site, and they didn't have a site. So now they, had, they know the site now, which is uh, in the American League office at 10 o'clock on uh, Thursday morning. Do you believe right now this is just a symbolic delay, or, or do you feel that this game could be in peril and we could be waiting here sometime? I don't think it's in peril. I, uh, I, I just think it's a symbolic delay known to me. Phillips. What will satisfy the umpires? We just uh, heard from Joe Morgan that uh, uh, at this hearing it, it's been predetermined quite possibly that uh, uh, there will be a suspension of Robbie Alomar right away. Would that be the only thing that would satisfy the umpires? At this particular time, I believe that's the only thing that's going to make them happy. All right, Marty, keep us updated. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Back upstairs to you, Bob. Well, meanwhile, the Players Association has not been heard from, at least publicly, and suppose the league does reverse its field a little bit and Alomar is hit with some sort of postseason suspension. We'll await at that point the reaction of Don Fear and Gene Orzo. Well, let me tell you this. If any player does not feel like he should be suspended, then something is wrong with the player. There are certain things in this game you have to respect the umpires, they have to respect the players. And if this happens and they do not suspend Roberto Alomar, I don't think the umpires are going to respect the players anymore, and then you're going to have more problems down the road. You told me before the game that this is one of the worst things you've ever seen in all your years in baseball, the Alomar incident. I played over 20 years, and I've been broadcasting for 10 more. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Not just the spitting, but the fact that he talked about the sun and, and all this is just... I'm very upset, if you can tell, and it bothers me Just because those, I was a player. For those who may not be aware, uh, John Hirschbeck, the umpire's young son, died uh, of a rare form of cancer, and he has a second son who is afflicted with the same disease. And Alomar, subsequent to the spitting incident, made a comment to this effect that since this family tragedy, Hirschbeck has not been the same man, not the same umpire. He's been embittered. Well, for those of us who have uh, known John Hirschbeck, uh, Bob, through all the years, uh, he's a quality umpire, and uh, the problems that he had with his family were very evident. I mean, I remember games and series where John Hirschbeck had to leave, and uh, a substitute umpire was brought in so that John Hirschbeck could be with his family. And uh, as Joe said, it's a, it's a terribly upsetting thing, not only the... Uh, uh, the incident where he spit, but uh, everything else that goes along with it. And uh, again, I've been around baseball a long time as you have. I, I've been around here 40 years plus, and uh, it, it's uh, something I've never witnessed in my life. It was ugly, real ugly. A couple of quick things here before we take a break. Number one, five games. No matter what the intention or thought process of Gene Budig might have been, when you consider that guys can get five games for brushing uh, a hitter back or for an incident involving players, and you're talking about the last line of authority between the players and the people who officiate the game, five games seems awfully lenient. Second, baseball has got to have a procedure for expedited hearings when you get to the end of the year because justice delayed is justice denied in a situation like this. You have got to be able to react in a timely fashion. And third, the commissioner of baseball, the acting commissioner of baseball, is Bud Selig. Bud Selig should be present in this situation. Even if it is a league matter, Bud Selig needs to be heard from. Bud Selig has to be on the scene or in front of television cameras. The impression, no matter what the thought process may be, the impression is that once again, that baseball has ineffectual leadership and is rudderless. 
Well, this is not an American League problem. This is a baseball problem. Therefore, you're right. I think the commissioner should be involved. All right, we're going to take a break here. Uh, as you heard Marty Springstead say, we don't think the game is in jeopardy, but obviously the start has been delayed. We'll come back. We'll give you the lineups. We'll talk about David Cohn and John Burkett and update the umpire situation in just a moment. Back to the Bronx, game one of the division series. The Rangers and the Yankees after this. was just moments ago the umpires making their way out of their dressing room and down the tunnel toward the field they are on the field right now there's Al Clark one of the six all of them veteran umpires assigned to work this division series a best of five between the Yankees and the Rangers they are on the field and Jim Gray shortly will be speaking with the head of their union the umpires union chief Richie Phillips and no sooner do I mention that than Jim indicates he has Richie Phillips so go ahead Jim all right, thank you, Bob. Richie, can you tell us exactly what the delay was all about, and has it been resolved? It has been resolved just now. The delay was about the fact that we were supposed to be notified at 2.02 today that a hearing was scheduled in the situs of the hearing. We didn't get that notification until 8.08 this evening, despite repeated inquiries throughout the day and evening. And you were even present when I was making those inquiries as the American League officials as to when this hearing is going to be scheduled on Thursday. It's now been scheduled for Thursday morning, 10 a.m. in the American League offices, and we are prepared to go into that hearing, and we're pre prepared to request that the suspension of Alomar go into effect immediately, and the suspension should be elaborated on by additional days of suspension and a very substantial fine. Anything short of that will not satisfy you, and if that is not the... If that does not happen in this hearing, will you pull the umpires off the field? In light of the vile and dehumanizing act that was committed by Roberto Alomar, nothing short of that would satisfy not only the umpires, I don't think it would satisfy the entirety of baseball and the entirety of this country. Baseball is supposed to be start, part of the social and cultural fabric of this country, and it means more than hits and runs and bats. And what it means is respect for authority and that authority should... Uh, and that the authority so you're saying you'll pull the umpires off if that's not the I'm, result? I'm saying that Friday morning we're going back in the court with an intention to continue if we don't get the result. That is in the, within the, the spirit of the agreement that was entered into today before Judge Ludwig in the United States District Court in Philadelphia. Richie, thank you. All right, Jim. All right, let's go upstairs to Bob Costas. All right, Jim, thanks a lot. Another Jim, Jim Evans, will work the plate as we look at the rest of the umpires, six-man crew. Here's another interesting aspect to this. If someone is suspended in the postseason, the general thinking is that postseason games don't count against regular season games on a one-to-one -one ratio. If you were suspended for two or three in the postseason, that has a greater effect on you and your team than five in the regular season. But Richie Phillips seems to be saying even five postseason games, that's what I infer, even five postseason games would not be enough, assuming that Baltimore continued into the next round. But it is a valid point to make, even if you say that Alomar should suffer a harsh penalty. It's a valid point to make that postseason games have to count for more than regular season games, and maybe two or three would be Budig's decision, Joe. I think that's the way it should be. I think three games in the playoffs should be the maximum. That's my personal opinion. All right, the batting order for the Texas Rangers. After a quarter century, they are finally in the playoffs for the first time. Darrell Hamilton will lead it off followed by the great young catcher, Ivan Rodriguez, best defensive catcher in the league and a 300 hitter. Rusty Greer out of nowhere at about 332. Juan Gonzalez, how do you hit 47 home runs and finish fifth in the league? You do it in this incredible year of offensive explosion, that's how. Will Clark, always a great postseason hitter when he was with the Giants, settled in the switch hitting DH. Dean Palmer at third, hit 38 home runs. Mark McLemore, switch hitting second baseman. And Kevin Elster at shortstop, batting ninth, facing David Cohn. Cohn 7-2 and two in a season which saw him miss four months because of the aneurysm discovered just beneath his right armpit. It was thought his season was certainly over and maybe his career was in jeopardy. Remarkably, he was able to return on Labor Day and pitch seven no-hit innings against the Oakland A's in his return. Hamilton hit 293. Strike one, says Jim Evans. 
This is Cone's ninth postseason start. Mets, Blue Jays, Yankees. A ball and a strike. A three and two record in postseason play. Against Texas this year, he had two outstanding April starts, ERA under one, a victory and a no decision. Fouled off, one and two. He's a guy who wants the ball in situations like this, youth. In September and October in his career, he's 28 and nine. Yeah, there are those guys, Bob, that, uh, that thrive on this kind of competition, and David Cohn is one of them. Joe Torre told us before the game tonight, if he's a little erratic in the first inning, it's nothing really to get worried about because he really comes on. One-two pitch, hits softly toward the middle of the diamond and charging to make the catch is Derek Jeter. Let's look at that Yankee defense, Joe. Well, I, I think the important part to this defense is Jeter at shortstop. Mariano Duncan, not as good defensively, but a very good hitter. Bernie Williams in center field, excellent. And Joe, Dura Joe Girardi behind the plate has really helped this staff by handling it well, calling pitches at the right time and making them work hard. Most of the Yankees will tell you that even though they gave up the long ball bat of Mike Stanley, who went to the Red Sox, that on balance, they feel they're better off with the way Girardi handles a pitching staff. And he gives you a little offensively, too. He can run well for a catcher, puts the ball in play, hit and run guy. Rodriguez slaps it to the right side. Martinez, a diving stop, covering his cone. And that's what you get with Tito Martinez. Kind of reminds you of Don Mattingly, excellent first baseman. This ball is smoked to the right side. Dive by Martinez. Picks it up, and he leads Cone perfectly. And that's out number two. That's the one thing that's so outstanding about Rodriguez, Joe, throughout his career. He, he not only hits balls in the gaps, I mean, he's got the ability to go the other way, and he'll do that, and do it with power from time to time. A strike to Rusty Greer. Only Alex Rodriguez, who led the league at 358. And then Frank Thomas, Chuck Knobloch, and Paul Molitor out hit Rusty Greer this year. Hanging out with some of the biggest names in the American League. Bob, you'll hear me talk about two pitches tonight. One is the cut fastball from David Cohn. The other will be the sinker from John Burkett. And Cohn has his working right now, especially against the left-handed hitters. He jammed Hamilton, and he also will throw Rusty Greer inside also. I'm going to say a splitter right there, Bob. Here it is again. Watch, watch this ball fall off right at the end. You won't be able to see it so much from this angle, but from that center field shot, you can see that thing fall off the table. Full count to Greer. The other thing about, about Cone that Joe talked about just a minute ago is the fact that he loves to work inside. He's not, he's not afraid at all to come in tight on anybody. Two out, nobody on top of the first. And the 3-2 pitch from Cone to Greer. Did he check? He didn't. First strikeout for Cone. Got him with the splitter, a 1-2-3 first. And the Yankees come up when we come back. John Burkett has been in the American League less than two months. He's never faced the Yankees, but this lineup includes several former National Leaguers, so there are some fellas who have had their hacks against Burkett, including Reigns when he was an Expo, Boggs, O'Neill, Williams, Martinez. The big story in this lineup is Darryl Strawberry, rather than Cecil Fielder as the DH, Duncan, Girardi, and Jeter, the bottom third. Strawberry in the National League was five for eight in his career against Burkett, including a homer and two doubles. So Straw will hit sixth and be the DH. His figures and Fielder's numbers virtually identical um, as Yankees this year. In every department, average, home run frequency, strikeout frequency, virtually identical. Burkett 11 and 12 overall, counting Florida. Five and two in 10 Texas starts. Rolled 
foul by Reigns, who at age 37 is hoping to make his first World Series appearance. Missed three months with sore hamstrings and returned late in the season with what he described as fresh legs. Hit 284 with nine homers, all of them left-handed. One and one. Bob, with Burkett, you will see a fastball, a sinking fastball, and a straight fastball, and a slider and a change. He does not throw the splitter anymore. He wants to make you hit it on the ground, obviously. If there aren't a lot of grass stains on the baseball tonight, Burkett won't be around long. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Loves those grass stains. That's right. Palmer in close at third. The 2 1 pitch. And he falls behind 3 and 1. Burkett's ERA with Texas. 4.06, not impressive, but almost a full run beneath the league average in this, the year of the hitter. Line hard, base hit. is what happens so many times when you pitch from behind. Here's a fastball right down the pipe. And Reigns right on it and rips a base hit to center. Joe said earlier, Bob, that this guy tries to pitch corners. I mean, he's, he's one of those guys that doesn't like to give India, but you can't consistently pitch from behind. We'll see it throughout the course of this game. But Reigns sitting on a 3-1 fastball comes up with a base hit. Hogs at the plate, O'Neal next. be interesting also for me to see if they try to steal with Rodriguez behind the plate because basically you steal on the pitcher so you shouldn't be concerned with who's behind the plate except if it's Rodriguez going on the first pitch box goes the opposite way we are heading for the line fair ball he can't get there a fan reached out and touched it so Reigns has stopped at third on the double by Boggs second and third nobody out and that ground rule double will cost the Yankees a run, at least at this time, because Reigns would have been able to score on that ball because he was running on the pitch. Well, they try to hit and run on the first pitch, and Box gets the sinker inside. He fights it off, really, and hits it down the left field line. Fair ball. You see it bounces up, and right there it is touched by a fan, and therefore it's a ground rule double and only two bases. How many times have you seen Boggs swing at a first pitch? Not too often. Not too often. But the Yankees like to play hit and run early in the mm -hmm. game this year. But he's one of those guys, Bob, you've watched him for years. He takes strikes. I mean, he takes pitches because he's that kind of a hitter. He's that great of a hitter. One of the obvious subplots of this series, the Yankees have a devastating bullpen. When you bring Mariano Rivera on as the setup man and then close with Wetland, you're trying to make it a 6-7 inning game with your starter and just get into that bullpen. Texas's bullpen is not nearly as effective. If the Yankees get in front early, it's going to be very difficult for Texas to come back. Now they're a big hitting ball club, Bob, and uh, they've done it many times this season. And in, in watching Texas play 13 or 14 times this year during the regular season, I mean, they have that ability. You, you know what kind of a club they have. They've got power up and down the lineup. And, and they have that capability, a base hit here, a base hit there, and bang, somebody bops one, and they're back in it. Johnny Oates with his pitching coach, Dick Bosman. 0-2 pitch. Hit the opposite way, and this one will fade foul. O'Neill hit 3-0-2 this year with 19 home runs. He's about as intense as they come and has been given to throwing tantrums after at-bats, which displeased him. And finally, Joe Torre has been a calming influence on this ball club. And O'Neill's wife, Neville, told him, you know, you don't look too good doing this. You look silly. Try and calm down. Rein it in a bit. Palmer with a diving stop. He'll hold the runners and go across the diamond on a dandy play to take care of O'Neill, robbing him of two runs batted in. I'm a little surprised, Bob, that Tim Raines didn't score on this ball. 
it was a ground ball and you're supposed to take off because everyone's playing back if he goes right away there's no way palmer would have had a chance to throw reigns out at the plate normally with the infield back you're going on on a ground any ground ball but reigns holds up and palmer's able to make the play over to first base Now Bernie Williams with 305 is 29 homers top the team. First pitch will get a run home. McLemore takes the out at first. Reigns crosses. Boggs to third with two down. One nothing New York. Well, a play by Dean Palmer is one of the big reasons why Texas is where they are tonight. Solid defensively. Palmer back in the lineup with a big bat, but I tell you. And, and we talked about this earlier tonight. This Texas club is solid defensively, up and down. Statistically, these are the two best defensive teams in the American League. Texas made the fewest errors. The Yankees the second fewest. The Rangers had a stretch this year of 15 consecutive games without anybody booting one. Tino Martinez. Breaking ball for a strike. You're right, Bob. They're, statistically, they're close, but if you're going to choose Texas is the better defensive team overall and that's in making the routine plays and not costing your pitcher any problem center field drifting over is Hamilton he played errorless ball for the season in center he tucks it away it could have been a lot worse for Burkett limits the Yankees to one For the second at Yankee Stadium. Cone staked to a 1-0 lead. Gonzalez to the plate. And strike one to him. Twice the American League's home run leader. Back-to-back. -back in 92 and 93 with 43 and 46. So that figure is a personal high at 47. Second in the league to Albert Bell in RBIs. Second in slugging to Mark McGuire. One and one. I think the Yankees are going to have to establish in their own minds how they can get Gonzalez out. You have to keep the fastball in on him as Cone did there and try to get him to chase breaking balls away because he's the guy on the Texas Rangers that if you let him get started, he can lead them to a sweep of this series. It's a second. Waiting for it is Duncan. He'll throw him out. They got him this time, but as you saw from that graphic, they hadn't figured out how to retire him during the year. Hit 541 with five homers against them in just 10 uh, ball games. Let's go downstairs to Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob Costas. I'm now joined by Randy Levine. He is the negotiator of all labor for Major League Baseball. Randy, why not convey to the umpires the time of the meeting? Why did it have to come at 8.08? Uh, we sent out a notice of scheduling and an order this afternoon. We made it clear. Uh, everybody uh, knew it. Uh, nobody from the Umpires Association called. We would have been delighted to tell them. Uh, members of the press knew. There was no secret. Yet it just seems that Major League Baseball fumbles and stumbles upon itself time and time again. Uh, I, I think that's quite unfair. Uh, there's a process. Uh, the process, a judge made a ruling uh, this morning. We honored the ruling to the T. The process is going forward. We have great games going on. And the procedures and processes that have been around for a long time should be followed as they have been, and let's worry about baseball. As we watch Will Clark at bat, it seems as though Major League Baseball, however, cowers to the Players Association. There's clearly a right and a wrong here. Why do you guys cower to them at every instance? Well, once again, I think that's a uh, ridiculous and false uh, presumption. Uh, nobody's cowered to anybody. Uh, the American League president made a decision. This was a heinous action. It was terrible, and there's a procedure that's in place. The Players Association had absolutely nothing to do with it. Dr. Budick made a decision based on uh, uh, his judgment. Uh, the process will go forward. It was a terrible act. Mr. Alomar apologized, and we should move on. And we'll move on with the game. Thanks, Randy, for Thank taking the question. Much. Thank you. All right, Bob, back to you. With one out now, and nobody on in the second, a 3-1 pitch coming to Will Clark, and the count is full. To wrap this up, I think it's fair to say, guys, that antagonism between players and umpires over the last several years is higher than it's ever been, at least in my memory, in baseball. Guys are going at one another. None of this justifies what Alomar did. Alomar's action set perhaps the, a new all-time low. But this antagonism has existed for years. Well, I like what Randy Levine did. He made lead like he wasn't going to be on. You see how he turned his head real quick? 
in the air to right center. O'Neal over. Interesting point, you. There's the second out. That's the stuff I look for. He knew he was going to be on, but looked the other way. And then when, when Jim Gray popped the question to him, that surprised look, the turn to his left. Huh? Come on. Kind of the not all about the game. Kind of the telltale sign you, you look for there. You, you got to look around in yeah. the seats. Don't be, a, don't be ashamed to do that. Well, he might have been counting the house. <laughs> you never know. Cohn has set down the first five he's faced. And strike one to Tettleton. A player of Cohn's quality would never have moved around as much as he has in an earlier era. But given the economics of the game, deep but foul to get every bit of that and send it soaring into the upper deck given the economics of the game you have Cohn who's pitched in the postseason for three different clubs he's won a Cy Young award for Kansas City and that's Pelton as he decides this ball's not going to stay fair he hit it hard that was that cut fastball that he tried to get inside on him and now he's ahead of him 0-2 one and two. So in Cohn's portfolio, we find that he went 20 and three for the Mets in 1988, won the Cy Young Award in the strike shortened season of 94 for Kansas City, then won a combined 18 and eight for the Blue Jays and Yankees last year. The one two. Now, there are a number of us have been through the same scenario for different reasons. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> I was given money by the club I left to leave. <laughs> Sort of a severance yeah. of some kind. See ya. Enjoy this. A lovely parting gift. The Samsonite <laughs> luggage, the Hager yes. slacks. And a gift to some restaurant uh, in another city. Something from the Spiegel catalog. <laughs> two and two. Got him. Six straight retired by Cohn, closing each inning with a strikeout. And he leads one set. <laughs> reaction for Daryl Strawberry just a few months ago he was in his own personal baseball exile with an independent club the St. Paul Saints Cecil Fielder over from the Tigers could have been the DH tonight and will according to Joe Torre be the DH tomorrow against right-hander Ken Hill unless Strawberry has a monster game tonight Burkett's 1-0 pitch Called strike. I think what Joe Torre was doing tonight, Bob, is matching up. Strawberry's a good low ball hitter, likes the ball out over the plate, and Burkett's ball will sink out over the plate unless he stays in as he's trying to do here. But his ball will sink out over the plate, which gives Strawberry room to extend, and that's what he wanted. Darrell followed by Duncan and Girardi. Adam out in front. And that's strawberry, uh, strawberry go to Joe Torre the other day and and uh, and tell Joe, he said, look, if you want to use Fielder, it's not going to upset me. He's the DH. He's the big daddy here. And Joe didn't decide until today. Call strike three. And that's how you have to pitch Daryl Strawberry. Threw him a change up for strike two, and then he comes busting back inside with a good fastball. You have to try to tie him up. You do not like to leave. You can't leave the ball out over the plate. Look at this fastball right on the inside corner, and it ties him up. It actually starts off the plate and moves right back on the inside corner. Looks more like a Greg Maddox pitch there. <laughs> awaiting his turn which should come tomorrow Mariano Duncan hit hard and through the hole he continues to sizzle he's always been a good player but this year he breaks out to hit 340 including 406 at Yankee Stadium now folks tomorrow night it's NBC's newest comedy night must see TV Wednesday wings Lara Kett, news radio all established programs and the new one, Men Behaving Badly, which I thought was the Euchre and Morgan story. NBC's newest <laughs> comedy hit, all tomorrow night on NBC. Okay. Well, I don't know about Joe, but... <laughs> to me, just the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Joe Girardi. 
Right, here's, a, here's a guy that hasn't done too bad a job this year for the Yankees. Yvonne Rodriguez, called by many probably the best catcher in all of baseball. But this guy does a good job behind the plate. I mean, he's a good receiver. He can run, as you alluded to earlier, Bob. He's got a little power from time to time. I'm, I'm not talking about home run power. I'm talking about gap power, doubles and triples. But this guy does a good job. He calls a good game, and, and, uh, and Joe Torre, I know, is happy with him. Don Zimmer, Joe Torre's bench assistant, was with Girardi in both Chicago and Colorado, recommended him highly. And Dwight Gooden gave him the highest compliment after he pitched a no-hitter. He said he's the best catcher he's ever thrown to. Popped up back of short. Elster, talk about a Lazarus man. Here's a guy who was with seven big league clubs, knocking around the minors. A decade ago, he was supposed to be the Mets shortstop in this town for a generation. It never panned out. And then he just comes out of nowhere to hit 24 home runs this year, drive home almost 100. Benji Gill got hurt early in the season. Elster didn't even necessarily have a spot on the roster, let alone a starting spot. Took that starting role and never relinquished it. Look at that. 35 homers in almost a decade, then 24 this year. But his strength as a shortstop, Bob, is his hands. He has great hands. Good fielding shortstop. Speaking of good shortstops, here's the certain American League Rookie of the Year, Derek Jeter. No less an authority than Phil Rizzuto says he will be the best Yankee shortstop ever. That would be quite a compliment. He hit 315 for the year and 356 after the All-Star break. I watched him down the stretch, Bob, and I was impressed with the way he handled himself in these pressure-packed games against Baltimore, against Boston. And, I mean, he's a young guy, but he said he was having fun. And that's contrary to what people think about rookies in tenor races. They think that they're not able to sustain and have fun and play the game as they did earlier in the year. But he played the game and had fun the entire season, and he contributed greatly down the stretch. Conferring with Rodriguez, Burkett back to work. Chasing Duncan back. Jeter could be a great player for 10 years or more and do it all in the shadow of Alex Rodriguez in the American League because Rodriguez might become the best player in baseball before all is said and done. Boy, what a year that guy had. Whoop. In there. Well, he's a big for a shortstop, too, Bob. Talking about Alex Rodriguez. Rangy. He's got tremendous power. He's one of those guys that's going to put on some pounds and and uh, and might be even better home run wise. But uh, man, he's he's a pure hitter, Joe. I know you've seen him a couple of times this year. He's a pure hitter. He really is. In on his fist that he fights it off. Jeter wins the award, as appears more than likely, he would join this list. Look at that, 62, 57, 51, two, three shortstops. Mm-hmm, because Tresh yeah. began as a shortstop right. before being switched to left field, and Tony Kubek, of course, was a shortstop. And Jeter fans to end the second. No runs a hit, a man left. After two, still one nothing. New York, game one of the division series. When the aneurysm was discovered in David Cohn's pitching arm just beneath the right armpit, he had the damaged part of the artery removed. The doctors grafted a section of vein from his thigh to replace it. He was on blood thinning medication until mid-June, and here he is on his first reaction to all that. And I guess we'll get to that after the first pitch to Dean Palmer, who sent 38 into the seats this year. A called strike, and here's Cohn. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand the meaning of aneurysm, but I knew it was a scary word. And I was, uh, you know, the first thought is life-threatening. Uh, you think J.R. Richard type story. Uh, and you're wondering if it's life-altering beyond that. Will I ever pitch again was the third question. And that, that's how much I didn't know. That's how in the dark I was. And as the, as the situation progressed and I learned a little bit, bit more about uh, what an aneurysm was, I, I had the feeling that maybe I could come back. I just didn't know when. 1-1 one, one pitch. O'Neill has this lined up. Seven straight, retired by Cone. Cone 
is 33 years old. Still has something of a baby face. He has the countenance of a choir boy, but as you guys know, the competitive disposition of a pit bull. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he just wants the ball when it counts. And as Joe Torre told us uh, prior to the game tonight, Bob, uh, we asked him about pitch counts with David Cohn. Is he going to worry about that tonight? He said, no, I don't worry about that with David Cohn. When David Cohn, when I asked David Cohn if he's tired or if he wants to come out, and he tells me he's tired or he's, he's starting to, to fade a little bit, I believe him. And he said if he wants to stay, he stays. There's Mel Stottlemyre. Whose son Todd Stottlemyre yeah. won for the Cardinals today over the Padres with relief help from Eckersley, 3-1 in St. Louis. Well, at the end of the playoffs last year, the end for the Yankees, Game 5 of the Division Series in Seattle, Buck Showalter didn't have much confidence in his bullpen, and so Cohn threw over 150 pitches until the gauge just simply reached empty when he finally bounced ball four to Doug Strange and he had to come out, but he threw every last pitch he had in that arm. You know, I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have come out of that game, Bob, uh, had, they, had they wanted to take him out. He wanted to stay. He wanted to pitch. The one two to McLemore. Paul strike three, the third strikeout for Cone. We've seen this pitch from both pitchers now. The ball starts off the plate inside to a left-hander, and it moves back over the plate for strike three. You see the rotation is rotating back, and see it moves right back on the inside corner. And this freezes McLemore. He thinks it's inside. See, he moves inside, and look at that ball move right back over the inside corner. Perfect pitch there from Cohn. We've also seen it from Burkett tonight. Takes a ball. Bob, to finish up that story about Cohn last year and to take it one step further, remember Randy Johnson in that last outing last year for him? You talk about somebody pitching until he was absolutely, I mean, on empty. It was Randy Johnson in that final game. One and one. Joe Torre unlikely to face that kind of desperation with the bullpen he has in place now. So if Cohn can get Joe and Mel Stottlemyre into the seventh tonight, they'd be <laughs> delighted to hand it over to Rivera and then Wetland. Absolutely. Just waved at it, one and two. Elster, despite having the best year of his career, hit just 208 in September. He played 157 games at shortstop in the heat of Arlington, Texas. Roaring on one and two. Doesn't get the strikeout. Jeter going back. Williams coming in. Three players converge, and the ball drops. It'll be a Texas League double for Texas's Kevin Elster. No other way to score it, but as a hit, the first for the Rangers. Reigns got there, Williams got there. Jeter, who's terrific at going back into the outfield on Pops with his back to the plate, couldn't corral this one. There you see it. Tim Reigns and Bernie Williams all had a shot, and I think Jeter... Get another look at this thing. There's Bernie Williams and Reigns. Reigns got a glove on the ball and never could hang on to it. This ball, Joe, I thought was hit high enough that somebody should have made a play on it. This I'm, ball was really up in the air. I'm agreeing with you. It seemed like it was right in no man's land, but it was high enough that maybe any of the three could have possibly caught it if they were going by themselves. They were all wary of where the other two were. It looked like Jeter pulled up a right. little bit. He did. Hamilton rolls it to Martinez. The double doesn't hurt. Elster stranded at second after two and a half. Cohn clings to the one nothing lead. Yankees lead at one nothing as we move to the bottom of the third. 31-year-old John Burkett has been a double-figure winner in every full year of his career, including this year, though he was under 500 of 11 and 12 combined between Florida and Texas. And we mentioned Cones moving around, partly due to the economics of baseball. Although a deal like this wouldn't have been unheard of in the past, they happen much more frequently now. A pitcher of Burkett's quality going from Florida to Texas in August for a couple of minor leaguers. Reigns showing bunt, taking a strike. His big year, one he's never approached, speaking of Burkett, before or since 1993, when he went 22-7 and seven for the Giants. Generally has excellent control. You saw Palmer in close at third. One and one to range.
Somebody described Burke and Joe as a poor man's Greg Maddox. <laughs> high praise or apt? Well, I, I think it's high praise because anytime you compare anyone to Greg Maddox, you're putting them in the upper echelon of pitchers in the major leagues. Salary-wise, that's true. But this guy, as, as do a lot of pitchers today, and, and I mean, speed is not the big deal anymore. It's always movement on the ball. We talked earlier today about different pitches in different eras. And I'm talking about the slider, the splitter, Joe, and, and now all of a sudden it's, it's the cutter. cutter. It's the yeah. cut fastball that has become the big pitch in baseball. I mean, it's a fastball, looks like a slider, but it's not a slider. It busts at the last moment and, and inside to a left-handed batter away from a right-hander from a right-handed pitcher. The 3-1 coming to Reigns, but first he steps out. Tim single to center and scored in the first. Reigns is very similar to Daryl Strawberry. He likes the ball down and out over the plate. Full count. That was it right there, Joe. Fastball down yeah. over the middle. Every once in a while, Reigns is going to pop you, too. He gets a pitch. And again, sitting ahead in the count, here's that last pitch. Fastball right down the pipe, about knee high. Had to cut and fouled it. But every once in a while, a pitch like that, he'll drive it to right, to right center. List this one toward Hamilton in shallow center field. He's been automatic this year, hasn't committed a single error. There's the first out in the bottom of the third. Good change up there from John Burkett. Well, you can see Joe Torrey was thinking the same way you were, Uke, that that ball should have been caught. And they're talking about, you know, Jeter saying, well, maybe I should have gone after it all the way. And I think that's exactly what Joe Torrey wanted to talk to him about. You're and right. When you see a young player and he makes what you think is a mistake, you try to correct it right away so it will not happen again. And unlike a lot of shortstops, Jeter is very good actually at going out to get the ball. Well, whatever Joe said to him, <laughs> it really made him think. <laughs> <laughs> Burkett's 0 1 to Boggs. A ball and a strike. Wade delivered one of his specialties his first time up. An opposite field double right on the line. Hit 311 this year. 14th time in a 15 year career. He's top 300. In on his fists and he rolls it to McLemore. There's the second out. Overhead shots courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes from Pompano Beach, Florida. A tradition going back 70 years for the Goodyear Blimps to appear over major sporting events, it says here. I assume invited on each of those occasions. Let's hope so. <laughs> it's unlikely for a dirigible just to be in the area. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of cruising by. Pretty much have to arrange for it. I still want to ride in that thing. I really do. Not so much inside the cabin either, you know? <laughs> I think it's a little slow for you, though. You. <laughs> or even to pull it down when it's landing, you know? I want to do that. Just want to ride that baby like Slim Pickens yeah, at the end of the movie, saying, huh? Yeah, let her go. Punch a hole there and whew, gone, baby. The 0-1 to O'Neal. Paul had an RBI ground out his first time up. Let me correct that. He was robbed of a hit by Palmer, and then the next hitter, Bernie Williams, got the RBI when he grounded out to the right side. In fact, it was Palmer's diving play off O'Neill's shot to third that prevented a possible big inning. But he should have had an RBI, so you were right. <laughs> I don't think that's going to help. I can't be covered for in this situation. Two and two. Ray should have scored. It's good graphic there. 16 of only 16 times, 145 games that he not reached first base. He also had 102 walks. And he gets him looking. Third strikeout for Burkett. Still one nothing after three in the Bronx. John Burkett's on top of his game. Now watch the rotation on this pitch. 
See, it's rotating away from the left-handed hitter. I mean, that's a beautiful pitch right there. Now watch the results. Now watch the movement. Watch how much this ball moves. Starts way inside and just runs back out over the plate for strike three. He's done that twice now. Cone back to work in the fourth. Way high to Rodriguez. Robbed of a hit on a nice play by Tino Martinez in the first. You know, one of the nice things about a game like this, Joe, is the catcher. Being the catcher in a game like this, you're just sitting back there. I mean, you're putting down a sign, holding the target up, and these guys are right there for the most part. David Cohn just missed that time with a high breaking ball, but both Rodriguez and Girardi, I mean, sitting there with a target up, and they're both right on. You know, if Rodriguez, you hit 250, he could be an all-star. Oh, as tremendous as he is, throwing out 50% of would-be base stealers, he'll win his fifth straight gold glove, won't be 25 for another month. But he's developed into a 300 hitter. Hit exactly that this year. Fisted into shallow right. It drops for a hit. Here's what happened elsewhere in the divisional playoffs. The day began at Camden Yards. Baltimore beats Cleveland 10-4. Surhoff hit two. Bonilla had a grand slam. Brady Anderson started the game with a homer off Charles Nagy. Alomar was one for four amid all the controversy with an RBI. St. Louis gets the homer in the first from Gaetti, and Stottlemyre makes it stand up with relief help. Eckersley finished the game. Actually got Tony Gwynn on a comebacker with two men on in the ninth. Tying runs were aboard, so the Cardinals take a 1-0 lead in their series. The Dodgers and Braves don't start until tomorrow in Los Angeles. Rusty Greer. Here's tomorrow's lineup. And you got to be alert in terms of television in this first round. We'll take tomorrow off. Actually, Joe, you won't. <laughs> You'll head for Baltimore and do game two with John Miller, I guess, yes. on ESPN. First game of the Braves and Dodgers also on ESPN. And from here at Yankee Stadium, you'll have to tune to Fox to see game two. Ken Hill for Texas and Andy Pettit for the Yankees. Interesting. Pettit, a strong contender for the Cy Young Award, Joe, and yet it's David Cohn because of his postseason experience who gets the call in game one meaning that if there is a game five in the series it would be Cone rather than this guy Pettit and I tell you what Andy Pettit wants to be out there tonight but he understands I'm sure he understands manager Joe Torre's decision to go with Cone because he has pitched so many big games in his career but Andy Pettit could have easily been out there as could Ken Hill for the Rangers Two and one. For one of the few times tonight, David Cohn pitching from behind. He hasn't walked a man yet. For that matter, neither is Burkett. Well, he's pitching carefully here because he has a hole open on the right side, so he doesn't want to come inside giving Greer something to pull in the hole. So that's why he stayed away, and he's missed, and he's going to go away again. Well, he was trying to. Blocked by Girardi. Nice play by Joe Girardi on a low inside breaking ball from Cohn. Watch Girardi get his body in front of this ball. Watch this. Nicely done. Nicely done. That's all they ask you to do. I saw you do that a few times, you. You betcha. <laughs> Bullpen, I loved it. That's where you got most of them. <laughs> now, you don't want any of those baseballs to get loose in no, the pen, I like you. it without a chest protector, too. Foul back, three and two. The Rangers have two hits off Cone, but each is a bloop. The double by Elster that fell between three fielders in the last inning. And the little flare into shallow right by Rodriguez to open this fourth inning. Cone struck this guy out on a 3-2 pitch his first time up. In the past, the Rangers have been kind of a big fly kind of a ball club. But this year, they hit and run a lot. They've done a lot of things to manufacture runs. And it wouldn't surprise me if Johnny Oates were not to send Rodriguez here with a 3-2 count on Greer. He is going. And he can slow up now because it's a walk to Greer. And some trouble in the fourth for Cone. Two on, nobody out. Gonzalez to the plate with Clark and Tettled in the follow. I think David Cone established how they're going to try to get Gonzalez out in the first inning. He, he threw him a breaking ball out over the plate for strike one, as we'll see here. Breaking ball for strike one. Then he comes off the plate inside to keep him honest. And then he jams him, comes back in again, hits him off the fist. 
and he gets him out. I think that's how they're going to try to pitch Gonzalez. In, out, more in than out. They're going to try to jam him because if he extends his arms, he'll hit it out of any part of this ballpark. point there you see they pitched him in again but if you're a cone and you're going to miss you want to miss way in and not miss three or four inches out over the plate where he can extend on it the 1 0 pitch a ball and a strike perfect pitching right there fastball in to keep him honest and then a slow curveball out over the outside part of the plate I mean, that's just perfect pitching there by David Cohn. There's no way he can hit this pitch. See him kind of pull off because he's been pitched inside and jammed the first time up. Rodriguez at second, Greer at first. And a long drive to left. Into the corner and into the seats. Well, George Steinbrenner better check the deed. Because these days, it's Juan Gonzalez who owns the New York Yankees. <laughs> Hit over 500 against them for the year. And this is his sixth home run and 19 RBIs now in just 11 games against the Yankees for Juan Gonzalez. He missed a few against New York this year because of injuries. Well, I said if you're going to miss inside, you have to miss off the plate inside. He was trying to go back inside, and he moved that ball about eight inches out over the plate. Now watch, he's trying to go inside. This pitch is not inside, and Gonzalez drills it. That's the danger of pitching these sluggers inside. If you miss, miss off the plate in. Don't miss to the middle of the plate. And now Clark sends one up the middle for another hit. Two singles, a walk, and a Gonzalez home run. The one nothing Yankee lead erased. And it's 3-1 Texas in the fourth. But Gonzalez is the guy that you just have to be careful with. He didn't have any place to put him, but he did not make the pitch that he wanted. He missed only about six inches. I mean, it may seem like a look at the target and look where the ball ends up. A little bit out over the plate, and Juan knows it's gone. It's just a matter of whether it's fair or foul. If you're going to keep coming inside to that guy, Joe, you can't knock. Yeah. You don't hit 47 home runs throughout the year without sitting on certain pitches and looking for pitches in different areas. So Cone cruising through the first three innings. It's a major speed bump here in the fourth. When you go over the, over the Texas Rangers ball club, you say to yourself, I can't let Gonzalez get hot. I can't let him do this. I can't let him lead them. But when you have no place to put him, you have to pitch to him. When you look at this Texas lineup, even with Rusty Greer and Will Clark, there's so much right-handed firepower with Rodriguez and Tettleton, of course, a switch hitter, and with Gonzalez and with Dean Palmer. And Cohn is the only right-hander scheduled to start in this series for New York. He'll be followed by Pettit, Key, and Rogers. You know, the thing with this lineup, Bob, with this Texas lineup, it doesn't make any difference. You know, you talk about right-handed pitching, left-handed pitching. When you look up and down this lineup, 293, 300, 330, 335, 314, 280, I mean, it doesn't make any difference who's pitching. If these guys sit and get the pitches, they hit them. There's power up and down the lineup. Here's the 2-1. And now Cone is behind 3-1. Here's Tettleton with 24 for the year, a switch hitter, and another guy that looks, he'll look in certain situations, he'll look breaking ball inside, fastball inside, and he'll turn on you. He'll turn around and really pull. This one has popped back of third. Not much foul ground here at Yankee Stadium, over by the tarp and in the seats. There's a lot of foul ground behind the plate in this ballpark, but not too much along the lines. Probably the worst park in baseball for a catcher on a wild pitch or a pass ball. You're running all day long back here. You'll see runners take two bases on a wild pitch or pass ball in this park. Clark at first, still nobody out. Three runs home, top of the fourth, 3-1 Texas. 
And a 3-2 pitch on the way from Cone to Tettleton. Struck him out. Splitter to get him. For strikeout number four. Now here's that last pitch by David Cohn. Tettleton sitting on a fastball. Got the splitter. Look at that ball bust down. In the dirt ended up and Tettleton chased it. Here it is again from Cohn. And it may have been a breaking ball. May have been a curveball, Bob. I thought it was a splitter. The first reaction from Tettleton. Cohn will mix in the occasional curveball. He's done it a few times in this inning. Got the biting slider, the fastball with the late break, and the devastating splitter. Very resourceful pitcher. He'll drop down sidearm on occasion, give you different looks. He hadn't done that yet tonight. And again, trailing now by a score of 3-1. to one. We haven't seen him drop down from the side. He'll make right-handed batters. He doesn't do it that often. But that's what makes you give as a right-handed hitter. You don't see it that often. The 1 0 to Palmer. And that'll make the seats. He's starting to get upstairs now, Joe. You see that? It's not only one or two pitches, it's three and four pitches in a sequence that he's starting to get upstairs. Breaking balls that he's starting to hang. Well, that one especially, that was a hanging breaking ball. Now, watch this ball just kind of spins. This is the curveball that you talked about, but watch it just spins and it just hangs up there. Palmer just misses it. working very quickly through the first three innings. Now in trouble in the fourth. The whole pace has slowed down. And this ball is blasted to left. Reigns goes back to the track, to the wall. Can't get it. It's a couple rows in and a two-run homer for Dean Palmer. A pair of home runs, a three-run shot, and now a two-run homer, and it's 5-1 Texas. Well, we talked about the hanger. He threw the pitch that he fouled back. The hanger was just a little too high for him to get to it. This one is down a little bit more, and Palmer just nails it down the left field line. Now watch this breaking ball. It's a little lower than the other one that was hanging. It's still high. But see, that one is low enough that he can get to it. The other one was just a little too high for him. And you see Cone knows that it's only 318 down the line. It's not that he hit the ball so far, but it's 318 down the line, so he doesn't have to hit it that hard. And Range gives it a great effort. He goes up into the stands, but the fans want a souvenir as well. And ball one high to McLemore. Stottlemyer will go out to talk with Cone. No one throwing as of yet in the Yankee bullpen. This is very surprising to me, Bob, because he was throwing very well. He was in complete control. The real key to me was when he fell behind Rusty Guerrier. All of a sudden, from that point on, ever since he's been in a stretch, that's been his downfall. He was retiring the runners, hitters, one, two, three, one, two, three. Once he got in a stretch here in this inning, he seemed to have started to hang the balls and not get as much on his fastball. Joe, I was going to say, he did most of his work early with a fastball. Exactly. Inside, inside, the strikeouts, called strikeout on Mickey Tettleton, and, and again, inside fastball, to Greer, inside fastball. All of a sudden got away from the fastball and is, and is doing more stuff with a breaking pitch. Rodriguez opened the inning with a flare to right. Greer walked on a 3-2 pitch. That was a crucial pitch. Right. Then Gonzalez lined a 1-1 offering into the seats and left for the home run that made it 3-1. Clark singled on the first pitch to him. Tettleton struck out on a 3-2 pitch, but then Palmer homered to left to make it 5-1. Still only one out. To make no mistake about it, starting pitchers always throw better from the windup. They're not as comfortable in the stretch as a reliever is. Roll to the right side. Duncan has it, juggles it, and recovers to get it. McLemore runs well, but Duncan stayed with it. Well, we talked about Duncan not being as good a fielder 
as Jeter is at shortstop. You see, he just kind of plays this ball off to the side, one-handed, hits off his heel of his glove, but he's able to regroup in time to get McLemore at first base. See, right there, I mean, pretty routine ground ball, but he caught it back in his stance rather than out in front, and he just barely is able to retire McLemore. A strike to Elster. Well, we talked earlier in the game about this Texas club, Joe, being able to come back and come back in a hurry. I mean, they're, they're so devastating power-wise. You make a couple of mistakes, base hit, a walk, and boom, somebody bangs you, and they're back in and on top. Seen it happen all year long. Well, against Burkett, Reigns singled to open the Yankee first, and Boggs hit the first pitch to him for a double. But Burkett didn't break. He kept it tidy, gave up just the one run, and now his teammates have gotten the cone. Burkett happy to sit and he watch his teammates it. build a lead. <laughs> well, you don't think it's nice to pitch on a club like this? I'm telling you, ERAs don't mean a thing on a club like Texas. Any of those clubs with the big boppers guys are going to hit a lot of home runs for you. You get innings. If you can soak up innings, they're going to win games for you. No matter what your ERA is, they'll win games for you. And Burkett's always been the kind of guy who gives you innings. Usually works into the seventh or eighth. Inside. Two and two. Five runs home in the Texas fourth. Cone gets a strikeout. His fifth of the game is second of the inning. But Texas sends eight to the plate and five of them score. Trailing now five to one. The Yankees will send Bernie Williams, Tino Martinez, and Darryl Strawberry to the plate against Burkett in the bottom of the fourth. Williams exchanging pleasantries as he stepped in with Ivan Rodriguez. They were Little League teammates. Juan Gonzalez also on the same team. Little League teammates in Puerto Rico. So loyalties concerning this series divided in the Commonwealth. Some Yankee fans and some Ranger rooters undoubtedly. Williams hit the 29 homers, a fine figure, but this year, when more than 40, 43 to be exact, hit 30, 17 players, an all-time record, hit 40. That's a fairly low total for a team leader, and the Yankees, in contrast to a lot of other teams in the American League, did not hit that many home runs. You're exactly right. Clark takes it unassisted. The Yankees hit 143, but they allowed the fewest home runs in the American League this year. Well, that's the one thing about, about the Yankees, and, and uh, if you look at David Cohn, look at what he's done tonight. First three innings, 37 pitches. In the last inning, he threw 31. But with this Yankee club, Joe, you've got to appreciate what Torrey has done right. and emphasize the pitching aspect. I mean, here's a club without a big bopper. Forget about Cecil Fielder. He didn't get here till late. He's at 12 home runs as a Yankee. But uh, to have a guy like Bernie Williams with 29, as your leader in this year of the home run, it tells you about this staff and, and what this club has done. Well, to take nothing away from the Orioles with their 257, or for that matter, the A's and the Mariners, both those teams hit more home runs than the Yankees' old record. And that's over the bag at third for an opposite field extra base hit for Tino Martinez. It'll be a one-out double. smart hitting here by Tino. He takes the sinker and is moving away from him and just hits it down the left field line. Can't pull everything that Burkett throws. When he makes that sinker go down and away, you have to go with it. And that's what Martinez does there. And the Yankees need base runners now. Strawberry struck out looking his first time up. Just to complete the thought, the record of the 61 Yankees, 240, stood until this year. But for perspective, 
the second highest club in the American League that year hit 189. The average American League team this year hit 192. A drive, hooking into the right field corner. Gonzalez in pursuit, and he makes the catch. Tagging at second and advancing to third is Martinez, but with two out. And that's where the improvement of Juan Gonzalez shows right here. He was not that great an outfielder before. He's really worked on it. Strawberry gets a little bit out in front of this pitch, hits it toward the end of the bat, hooks it in the corner, but a good job by Gonzalez running this ball down. I mean, he's not known for his defense until this year. He's really worked hard on it and become a very good outfielder. But again, the Texas ball club is a very good defensive ball club. Duncan single to left his first time in an RBI spot here Martinez at third with two out right field Gonzalez closing ground on it but can't get there the Yankees inch a bit closer it's five to two on the RBI hit from Mariano Duncan sounded like he broke his bat on this little flare hit by Duncan in the right big base hit with two outs for the Yankees and they pulled it within three now on this soft little fly by Duncan. He hit that ball right on the trademark, it looked like, Joe. Sounded like he broke his bat, and Gonzalez pulling up short, and it's an RBI single. Girardi, who's 0 for 1. This pitch is upstairs. The pitch is upstairs from Birkin. Watch Duncan now. This ball right around the trademark. A little flare to right. And the Yankees get an RBI. That's a big base hit with two outs. Really a big base hit. 2-0 to Girardi. Just to finish the thought, the Mantle Maris Club of 1961 with those 240 home runs, they stood out from the pack. This year, several teams either exceeded or approached 200 homers, and these clubs played with the DH, and the Yankees did not. So you got to take some of this with a grain of salt. 2-0 pitch. Palmer in foul ground, 2-1. Well, I just think the game has really changed a lot. It's, you know, there are more guys that are stronger than ever before. Pitchers that are not making the pitches that they're supposed to make. And I still think that the ball is a little livelier than it was before. Well, you see some of these games every night on baseball right. tonight, 15-11, to 13-10. 10 to 9. Sometimes you think you're watching a, a game between the Police Benevolent Association and local Steamfitters 106. The only thing that's missing is a bench with a keg of beer and a guy selling raffle tickets. Well, you'll be arrested and hit with a pipe tonight when we leave here. <laughs> That'll pretty much cover it. <laughs> Liner base hit. Wheeling around second is Duncan. Runners at the corners with two out as the Yankees come alive in the fourth. And there's Johnny Oates. I think he's getting a little concerned. Again, this pitch is up. You talked about the pitch being up to Duncan. This pitch is a hanger right there. You see, that's a little slider that just hangs over the middle of the plate. It's supposed to be outside. Stays right up there. And Girardi lines it into right center field. And the Yankees have runners at first and third with two down now. I think the hit by Duncan was really important because they had not scored a run since the first inning yep. and Burkett was settling in. And he had two out, a bloop, but yet and still, it gets a run home, and it shows them that they can score off of Burkett. Again. Well, especially, Joe, after the good catch by Gonzalez on the ball hit by Strawberry, which is really a downer. Then, bang, Duncan comes up with a base hit to knock in a run. As you watch these playoffs, National League to American League, a huge difference. American League, a 315 hitter is your number nine guy. <laughs> A 50 home run guy is your leadoff man if you're yep. the Orioles. And he launched one off Charles Nagy to start the game at Camden Yards. You know, they can say what they want about the baseball and the ballpark at Camden Yards. 
in on his fist. Good pitch from Burkett. Palmer to McLemore. Almost pulled him off the bag. But Mark stays on it. Yankees settle for one, lead two. And Burkett's lead is trimmed to 5-2 after four. Here's a look at the Hurts game summary. Yankees got a run in the first. David Cohn made it stand up until the fourth when Gonzalez touched him for a three-run homer and Palmer followed shortly thereafter with a two-run shot. And then Mariano Duncan with a blue pit to make it 5-2 in the bottom half of the inning. We move to the fifth. The game summary brought to you by Hertz for business, for pleasure. Nobody does it exactly like Hertz. The leadoff man, Darryl Hamilton. 0 for 2 so far and 0 and 2 the count. Interesting here in the fifth inning after giving up the runs in the fourth, he comes out and establishes his fastball again. Yuke, he comes mm -hmm. out two good fastballs to Hamilton. Yep. Thought Darrell Hamilton turned around on Jimmy Evans and said that was low. Low. I thought the first pitch was high. Have you noticed a difference in the strike zone this year, Joe? No. I haven't. No. I mean, they talk about speeding up the game and they're going to call strikes in different areas than they normally do. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't noticed anything. I don't think you can expect an umpire who's been calling one strike zone for the last 10 or 12 years to all of a sudden move it up four inches and down three. I, I don't you. think you can do that. Absolutely. So the textbook strike, the strike at the letters, is almost non-existent, right? That's, that's the way I see it. A leaping catch by Boggs at third as McLemore tried to go the other way. Make it Hamilton. Darrell Hamilton didn't really get this ball all the way. He kind of hit it around the trademark again. Boggs timing his leap perfectly. Watch this. That's about as high as Boggs will get. Makes the play on Daryl Hamilton. Nice play by Boggs. Boggs has won two gold gloves now in his career. And has done it in the latter stages of right. his career. He was not that good defensively when he first came up, and he's worked and worked at it. A strike to Rodriguez, robbed of a hit by Martinez, and then single to right his second time up. There's a breaking ball from Cohn's good breaking ball, and Rodriguez can't hold up. Almost looked like a pitch that Rodriguez was sitting fastball, Joe. You Both. know, he's saying, fastball, I'm going. And Both all of a sudden pitches. you see the breaking ball right. Can't stop your swing. One and two, Rodriguez hit 19 home runs this year, but more impressive are the 47 doubles, most ever by a big league catcher. Mm -hmm. Two and two as he dropped down. I'm still saying a lot of times he ran across the mound. I can't believe that, 47. <laughs> 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 That's the way Rodriguez went right there. <laughs> hey, a double's a double. Everybody's watching the flight of the ball. Nobody's watching the runner. The 2-2. Struck him out. Number six for David Cohn. It's amazing. He hung a couple of breaking balls to Palmer. Now he just makes perfect pitches here to Rodriguez. Watch this pitch. It starts in the strike zone, which is where you want the breaking ball to start with two strikes. Starts in the strike zone, and you see the rotation. It's diving down and away. Nothing you can do with it. See, now watch it. Start. It's in the strike zone. In the strike zone, all of a sudden it's gone. That's what you want to do with a two-strike breaking ball. In his two April starts against Texas, Cohn was superb both times, worked 14 total innings, struck out 16. Allowed only one earned run in those two starts. Trails here 5-2 in the fifth. With the additional teams and with the balanced schedule being what it is, teams go long stretches now without playing certain other clubs, sometimes even within their own division. So these clubs haven't seen each other since the end of July. Right. 
And some of the personnel is different, either because of late additions or because players are at a different stage of the season. Guys who are hot have cooled off. Guys occupying different spots in the lineup. A guy like Roger Pavlik, for example, was an all-star at midseason for the Rangers and is not in their rotation as a long reliever as we move toward the playoffs. Kevin Gross with the bad back, done for the year. Missed all of September. Important guy for Johnny Oates and Dick Bosman during most of the season, the veteran right-hander. Two-two pitch. Oh, that was close. And you see David Cohen just kind of drop his head out there. He really wanted this pitch. Now watch, this is kind of that cutter we talked about. Starts up and look, it moves off the plate inside. And Evans calls it a ball. Now watch, it starts on the corner and just moves off at the last second. And the 3-2 pitch is taken into center field by Greer, who's now one for two with a walk. Rusty Greer holding off on that cutter, as Joe said. Here's a fastball. Looked like a little sinker, Joe. Came back from the inside corner, but knee high and right down the middle, and Greer singles the center. The pitch that we looked at before was a ball. I mean, Greer held yeah. back. It was a breaking ball or a cutter, as you said, but it was off the inside corner. Cracked rib for Rusty Greer. Sidelined him for some crucial games in September, and as you saw, that coincided with a big losing streak. A nine-game lead went down to one after they were swept four straight by their nemesis, the Seattle Mariners, a team that really has the Rangers number. And everybody said, are they going to do it again? Never made it to postseason play in a quarter century since the old Washington Senators became the Texas Rangers, but they pulled it together. Burkett and Ken Hill won crucial games in California, and they held the Mariners off and eventually won it by four and a half in the West. Isn't it funny, Bob, how much of a, of a part Seattle played in the finish for both of these clubs this year? Texas went up there and got swept. The Yankees went out there and got ripped apart by Seattle. Gonzalez, who homered his last time. Out in front again, 0-2. I think if you're David Cohn and maybe the rest of the Yankees, you are going to try to get him to chase that breaking ball off the plate. Gonzalez knew that they were going to come with the breaking ball. But now 0-2, if you come with the fastball inside, you've got to come way inside and not miss to the middle of the plate. One and two. There's that sidearm pitch. That's about the third one he's thrown tonight. He tried to drop down and, and hit the outside corner. That little sinker, here it is, right here. Tried to get it to come back and catch the outside, but he's down low and away. You're right, Joe, about Gonzalez. I mean, he'll look, too. Breaking ball. If you hang one, he can hurt you there, too. Going on the 1-2 pitch and tip foul. Both of these clubs really won their divisions in the season's first half, spurting out to big leads and then playing just around 500 after the All-Star break, but good enough for the Yankees to hold off the Orioles and the Rangers, despite a major scare, to fend off Seattle. I think that was a smart play by Oates to send Greer because if he was thrown out, Gonzalez would start all over again next inning without any strikes on him. Not going this time. And it's two and two. I think it, a lot of times if you have a slugger up there, he gets two strikes on him, and you have a base runner first, it's just send him. If he makes it, he gives the opportunity for their slugger to drive him in. If he's out, then your slugger starts all over again next inning with no count. He stays put, and now the count is full. And I wouldn't bet in my house, but I'll bet yours, Bob's, and yours, Ukes, that this is a breaking ball away. I'll tell you what, I, I wouldn't see any other pitch, Joe, a splitter or a breaking ball, a splitter or, or a curveball down and away to try and get him to chase. I, don't, I, just didn't, I, I just don't want this guy to hit another one on me or take me deep again. I don't think he can risk the splitter. I think it has to be a curveball. Greer goes, here it comes, and we'll do it all over again. And you were right, it was a slider. A little cut fastball. Cutter. It's a cutter. Yep. But again, he threw it in a heck of a spot, Joe. Yeah, I mean, he... if he's going to hit that, he's going to hit it foul in the upper deck. There it is right there. Look at it. 
I'll tell you what, maybe you would have lost your house, Bob. <laughs> that was definitely not a curveball. It didn't look like it to me. No, you're right. That's There's it. a breaking ball, and down he goes. Two more strikeouts in this inning for Cohn. Seven for the game, but he still trails 5-2 halfway through. Yankee Stadium still a strikingly beautiful and dramatic setting for a ball game, especially an important October ball game. 66 degrees at game time. Gorgeous weather the last few days here. It's a beautiful playing field, Bob. It really is. You ask the players about it, the infield, the outfield. This place is manicured beautifully. And so much history here. Mm -hmm. 33 pennants, 22 World Series championships. 35 years ago today, Roger Maris hit number 61 in this ballpark since remodeled of course but it retains much of the feeling mm -hmm. of the old park they kept part of the facade and moved it out beyond the center field bleachers still has that distinctive look reigns is one for two starts it in the fifth burkett and the rangers leading cone and the yankees five to two He went third again. He definitely went. Larry Young, the ump down there. One and two. Here's that last pitch in the uh, the swing by Reigns, or what he thought was a check swing. You see that? He went around right there. Larry Young made the call from third. Wouldn't it be great if Al Clark made it from the left field line? <laughs> Not entirely pleased with Jim Evans. Well, that's that same pitch we've seen. It starts off the plate inside and moves back on the inside corner. And Reigns gets caught looking. And watch the ball is inside right there. Inside now it moves right back on the inside corner. Now let's take a look at it. Inside, inside. Now it moves right there on the corner. Excellent pitch there by Burkett. has doubled and grounded out only a couple of weeks ago he was sent home from Detroit excruciating back pain some thought his season was finished found a chiropractor in Toronto we're told the chiropractor worked miracles his Boggs back swinging well although they're likely to use Charlie Hayes when a left-hander goes Darren Oliver scheduled in game three at the ballpark in Arlington and probably for the first time in his career he has been pinch hit for on a consistent basis here late in the ball game with Charlie Hayes. And a weak wave at that one on three pitches. Boggs, who only rarely strikes out, is retired by Burkett. Fifth strikeout for John. Well, I don't know how much the chiropractor did for him. He looks good taking, too. And here's that last swing, as you said, Bob. That's not a bog swing. That was a fastball. I don't know if he was looking for something else off speed or what. Yeah, that'll Just put a, a pain in your sacroiliac. Boy, I'm telling you. Well, it's, as you know, sometimes you, you'll be standing in a batter's box and you actually lose the ball. Are you talking ball. about me, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. But you actually <laughs> lose the ball. A little pop into foul ground, Palmer. That takes care of O'Neill, and the top of the Yankee order goes very quickly and meekly in the bottom of the fifth. 5-2 Rangers. On to the sixth. Will Clark, Mickey Tettleton, Dean Palmer scheduled against David Cohn. Ball one to Will, who's one for two. All five Texas runs came in the fourth. Three run homer by Juan Gonzalez. Two runs shot off the bat of Dean Palmer. Will Clark still a dangerous hitter, especially in the clutch. 284 this year, 302 for his career, but his power numbers have fallen off, and his slugging percentage now is beneath that of the average major league first baseman. But with a game on the line where you just need a base hit, he's one of the guys you'd least like to see if you're the opposing pitcher. I think one of the reasons that his power numbers have fallen off, he's had a lot of injuries to his hands and shoulders, and he doesn't get the same extension that he got before. But, like you said, if he only needs a single to win a ball game, he's the best at setting a pitcher up, 
and knowing what a pitch is going to do with him, he will go with the pitch, et cetera. But he doesn't get the barrel out there as often as he did before out in front of the pitch. A devastating postseason hitter for the San Francisco Giants in 87 and 89. Always had one of the prettiest swings in right. baseball. It was a little longer before, though, you, and mm -hmm. that's why he generated more power. It's a shorter swing now, but with not as much power. Still two and two. There's a pitch you're talking about right there, Joe. Right. A few years back, he'd have drove that ball to right field. He's a little bit tardy on it right now. Now watch how he's late getting his barrel of the bat out to this ball. This is a pitch that he should hit right there. But you can see he's late, and he's really just fighting it off rather than extending trying to drive it. Ripped foul with various aches and pains. Clark was on the disabled list three times this season. And that's tough for a guy like Will because Will loves to play. And, you know, he is one of the leaders of this ball club. He, along with Gonzalez, Rodriguez, they've got a lot of leaders on this ball club. I think that's what makes this such a tough Texas team compared to the teams they've had in the past that have not been able to hold up under the pressure. Full count. <laughs> Evidence of his effectiveness in October. But, of course, all that goes back seven years to his last postseason appearance. Lifted Bernie Williams' way, not quite to the track, to tuck it away for out number one in the sixth. The blimp is still up there, folks. The Goodyear blimp stars and stripes. Their first live sports coverage, <laughs> trivia fans, was in 1960, the Orange Bowl football game. Tendleton has struck out twice. Lots of guys in this Texas lineup with huge strikeout totals. And Tettleton, as always, is one of them. He walks a lot, too, almost 100 free passes. Well, on those muggy nights in Texas, if you sit close enough to home plate, you'll catch a breeze with some of these guys flailing away. Here's the 2-0. And Cone's behind 3-0. His pitch count since the fourth has really shot up. Kelly made a comeback back in the fifth inning, picking up a couple of strikeouts. Two out single by Greer, then came back to get the strikeout. And he walks Tendleton on four pitches. Bob, a pitcher's confidence ebbs and flows during a ball game. You know, at the first part of the game, he was working quickly because he was out in front. This pitch will be low, and you'll see it sink below the strike zone. And there's Joe Torrey. He thought the pitch was a strike on the knees. And you hear him yell and say, that's not low. National League strike. That's what Joe sees. Fouled off by Palmer. Took a look at Torrey and Stottlemyre. Each at least part of the time today with their thoughts elsewhere to relatives. Joe to his older brother, Frank Torrey, the former Milwaukee Brave, who is still awaiting a heart transplant at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital for two months now, awaiting the proper match. Watches all the Yankee games, and Joe tells us that he's constantly calling in with lineup suggestions and strategic advice. And Mel Stottlemyre had to be casting an eye toward the ESPN telecast from St. Louis. Todd Stottlemyre, his son, the Cardinal right-hander, former Oakland A, reunited with Tony La Russa in St. Louis, pitching extremely well and picking up the victory as the Cardinals take game one against San Diego. Well, we all had a chance to talk with, uh, with Frank Torrey tonight, Bob. And, uh, and he's doing well as well as can be expected. And as you said, uh, he's in constant contact with Joe each and every day during the regular season, and I'm sure during the postseason. He's, he's been a longtime friend of mine. Had a chance to spend about three hours with him last week here, and he's doing, doing good. We wish him the best. One and two to Palmer, who homered his last time. And this is backing out of play. The Palmer home run was far from a tape measure shot. Tim Raines went up and almost got a glove on it. It landed a couple of rows in. 
over the relatively short barrier in left field here at Yankee Stadium. One-two pitch. Off the outside corner and low. Here's another look at the homer by Palmer back in the fourth and Rain's attempt to get it. You see Rain's up against the wall, climbing up on top of the wall. Ball back by about two rows. Somebody had a chance and missed it. Isn't it funny, Joe, how you see the, the difference in a swing on that breaking ball down low and away and something upstairs when their eyes light up and everything else? <laughs> it's 318 down the left field line here, 314 to the right field corner. 408 to straightaway center. 399 in left center, 385 to the right center gap. Bouncer up the middle. Jeter can't get it. Tattleton is very slow and slower still since he's been playing with a brace on an injured knee. You can see the brace through the uniform pant leg and it may require off-season surgery so there was no chance for him to consider going to third. First and second with one out. You take a look at this pitch from Paul, by Palmer grounded right back up through the middle over the head of Cone and Jeter just can't get there. And now Mark McLemore, who's 0 for 2. Inside and low. McLemore played for Johnny Oates for a few seasons in Baltimore. Oates has always been high on him. Stottlemyer can't be too high on what he's seeing the last few innings from Cone. I think this is one of those situations where Joe Torrey sends him out to find out if anything's wrong with him and if he's tiring or if he feels like he can go a little longer. Brian Bowringer, as you see, gets up to throw. Cohen has already exceeded 100 pitches. Well, as Joe Torrey told us before the game, Bob, it's, it's not up to him. He, he always waits on Cone, and and talking there with Don Zimmer, and and as you said, Cone to me appears to be tiring a little bit. His pitches are starting to be up around the belt and even above that. The breaking stuff and that fastball that Palmer hit was upstairs. But Joe says, when David Cone says I've had enough or I'm I'm getting tired, then he'll make the change. 1-0 pitch ripped over the leaping Duncan. Another run will come home. And maybe that change should have happened at least one pitch sooner. It's 6-2. to two. A ringing RBI hit for McLemore. Well, because he was behind in the count, he had to come in with a fastball. And he gives him a fastball right out over the plate. And McLemore lines it just over the head of Mariano Duncan. You see the setup. Now look where this pitch is, right there in the middle of the plate and about belt high. The eighth hit for Texas. Here's Elstrew had the first of them. A bloop double back in the third. And he's pushing the ball now. I mean, he's, that was supposed to be a breaking ball. You can see there was no snap at all in his arm. I mean, this pitch is just kind of a push up there. Not much behind it or anything. See, there's no rotation, no tight spin. Ball does not break very much. Even that fastball didn't have good top on it. It was, had good location. It was away, but not good velocity on it. Yeah, he think, looks like he's yeah. tired, Joe. You're right. So I think he may not have told Mel Stottlemyre the mm -hmm. truth when he came out there. Well, he didn't have anybody up. Boringer had only thrown a couple of pitches. Weathers is up now. Out of play down the right field side. There is David Weathers. He's only been up about three or four minutes. Well, they got Boringer up for a moment. Mm -hmm. He was up and then Weathers. Right. 
Well, that's that book he has there. He's looking to see who matches up well against the next couple of hitters in the lineup. Two on, one out, a run already home. And now a full count to Elster. Cone has walked only two. But he has gone deep into the count with many hitters. In fact, Elliot Cow working with us here in the booth, says this is the eighth full count. And we're only in the sixth inning for Cone. Runners go. Called third strike. They throw through, and it's a strikeout throwout. So Cone gets out of the inning with his eighth strikeout. But another run to make it 6-2 Texas. Now here's that last throw by Girardi, and instead of taking Palmer, he takes the trailer in Mark McLemore, and they cut him down. Good play by Girardi, but Joe, it looked like McLemore slowed up a little bit. Well, what he did, he ran as if it was a hit and run. And when you're a base stealer, you should always be stealing the base, even though the hit and run is on. And it's, like you say, a very smart play there by Girardi. Especially because with runners at first and second, Martinez is playing behind him. Should be able to get a huge lead and a good jump, and McLemore's speedy. Now Williams spanks one into center field on the first pitch, and he's aboard to start the bottom of the sixth. That last run that the Yankees gave up in the sixth inning is really going to come back to haunt them. A 5-2 to two lead, I mean, you really still like, feel like you're still in the ballgame. But 6-2, to two, only one more run, but it seems like a lot more when you're playing catch-up. Here is the much maligned Graham Lloyd. Added, in a surprise to some, to the playoff roster in a decision made yesterday. Inside to Martinez. He started the year with the club you cover, you. The Milwaukee Brewers, he's had moments of effectiveness, speaking of Lloyd, but since he came over to the Yankees, he's been throwing batting practice. The Yankees contest the validity of the trade with the Brewers, claiming that Lloyd was damaged goods, but he's on the playoff roster. Well, Joe Torre says he's healthy now. He had, he had uh, to sit from time to time with Milwaukee, too. Bill Garner was the kind of a manager that used him maybe twice in a row and then would sit him for a couple of days and let him rest. But he's pitched a lot here, and uh, as you said, he's been hit. But Joe Torre, he still likes him. He's effective against left-handed. A drive to deep right, more than far enough, but foul. I still think Graham Lloyd can pitch with the Yankees. I really do. And again, uh, uh, to use him against the left-hander is, is the proper thing to do. Here's Martinez out in front. He knew he got out in front of it. He knew he got out in front of it. Pitch was upstairs, and he pulled it foul. Williams at first, nobody out. 6-2 Texas, bottom of the sixth. Hits softly, but maybe in a good spot. It's going to dunk in there for a hit. Williams speeds to third. Runners at the corners, nobody out. We'd say this is a blue pit, which it really is, but the reason it becomes a base hit is because the pitch is up. And if you're a sinker ball pitcher, you do not want the ball up. You may jam hitters, but they're going to bloop them in when the ball's up. If that pitch is down, it's a ground ball at second base and maybe a double play. So Burkett is starting to get the ball up a little bit, too. And out comes Dick Bosman because I think he realizes that they're, they're kind of right at the crossroads for Burkett. They want him to go a couple more innings if possible because they don't want to get into that bullpen too quickly. the Texas bullpen. That's Dennis Cook, the left-hander, and Danny Patterson is the right-hander. You're right, Joe. He's, he, he appears to be a little tired, too. Again, the pitch upstairs and the soft little flare by Tino Martinez. Well, as soon as Bosman finishes having his say, as Johnny Oates watches from the dugout, Darryl Strawberry will step in for his biggest at-bat in years. Must have really been warm in Texas this summer to see Johnny Oates wearing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> On a night when the game time temperature was a very pleasant 66. Yeah. 
I think those are his hitting gloves. <laughs> Straw has struck out and lined hard to Gonzalez and right. Foul, strike one. He was, he was in his zone, Joe. I was going to say he was in his area on that one. Yep, he was. Here's that last pitch. That, that's getting close right there. He's in the area. Yeah, if that pitch is four more inches out over the plate, he might be in serious trouble. For those of you who are watching at home, you see Burkett stand on the mound. He wipes on his chest sometimes. That's adding numbers to the pitches. He wipes below his belt. He's subtracting. Right up there, he's adding one. The 0 1. The strange twists and turns of a baseball season and of individual careers. In early August, John Burkett never could have thought he'd be in the postseason. He was with Florida. Strawberry was even farther away from a moment like this. He was in St. Paul and the phone was not ringing. I think one of the reasons the Yankees brought Strawberry here and Fielder is simply because they did not have a lot of power and they felt like they needed power because you need power to come from behind late in ball games. A bad swing and a pitch out of the strike zone and Burkett fans Strawberry for the second time tonight. The perfect pitching there by Burkett in that with two strikes this is up and out of the strike zone and Strawberry does not like the ball up. He likes the ball down and out over the plate. And this pitch is up and away and strike three. And Strawberry chases it, and he knows. He says, I can't hit that pitch. So now Duncan, who's two for two, a pair of singles, RBI as last time. Wherever he's gone, he's been with winners been in the playoffs in 85 with the Dodgers, in 90 with the world champion Reds, in 93 with the Phillies, last year back in Cincinnati, and now this year with the Yanks. Williams, who singled to open the inning, is now at third. Martinez, who followed with a hit, is at first. Dirt one and one. Uh, Fire Rodriguez sits outside to take that breaking ball from Burkett. The pitch before, when Duncan stepped out, it's funny to watch catchers when they're sitting outside like that. And as soon as you call time, they jump back in real quick. <laughs> they don't want you to see where they're sitting. Breaking ball here. Swings over it. One and two. Good slider by Burkett. Mariano Duncan is pretty much a free swinger. He hits, swings at the first pitch just about every at bat. And this slider starts away and he just chases it. See the rotation there moving down and away. And he's punched out of there. So after two singles to open the inning, Burkett comes back with a pair of strikeouts and he now has seven. Again, this pitch appears to be a little high. Rodriguez pulls it down around the outside corner. You see Punch Rodriguez saying, that a baby. Duncan thought the pitch was high. Here's another look. That's what Rodriguez sees. That's a questionable call right there. Pitch was uh, a little bit high. Watch it again. Off the outside, maybe. Close enough to hit. We've got a problem here in right and uh, Juan Gonzalez is uh, maybe uh, maybe something going on out there with fans throwing things and I think that's what it is and that has yeah. happened here yep. before going back to the World Series in the 1970s between the Yankees and the Dodgers mm -hmm. it's a minority of course but a despicable minority of the fans at Yankee Stadium and it creates a sometimes intimidating and distracting atmosphere for the opposition. This is a difficult place to play in postseason because of that tiny but very unwelcome element. Yeah, it's, it, it's tough, Bob. It's bad. Uh, we've seen it happen here before. I know in some of the 
some of the games against the Boston Red Sox and in both parks uh, the outfielders have terrible problems uh, you know it's, it's bad enough playing in front of a hostile crowd I mean you're in the other guy's ballpark but then they have objects thrown at you and uh, and Gonzalez said hey you know let's let somebody know what's going on here I'm surprised they haven't made an announcement yet over the public address system although I don't know how much good that would do either now Girardi I wouldn't mind an announcement just to have an excuse to hear Bob Shepard's voice. Yep. Give him something to say. Absolutely. Well, an inning that started very promisingly. First and third, nobody out. On the verge of going down the drain here for the Yankees unless Girardi can come through. He singled his last time. He's one for two. He hit 294 for the year. The sign of a good pitcher is how he limits the damage when he gets in trouble. And Burkett has done that tonight, beginning in the first inning. Exactly. Now that's when the Yankees had their shot, Bob. They really did. I think his first and third, and, and uh, really at second and third, actually, had a chance to really do some damage, and he got out of it with only a run. Behind Girardi, 2-0. Misses inside 3 and 0. Johnny Oates caught for the Yankees as a backup in 80 and 81, then managed their Columbus Farm Club in the early 80s. Torrey in the other dugout taking all the way, strike one to Girardi. Girardi more or less the regular catcher, but Leyritz is the personal catcher of Andy Pettit, so Leyritz will get the start tomorrow night in game two. Pettit who won 21, there's Leyritz, was 13-3 and three after a Yankee loss, which may be the case come tomorrow. But the bases are loaded now, and the tying run comes to the plate in the person of Jeter, who hit 10 home runs this year. This is what any manager asks from time to time when you're behind in a game to give yourself a shot with the tying run coming to the plate. He's got it now in Jeter with two outs and Burkett's still on. Burkett, whose control is usually excellent, hadn't walked anybody before sending Girardi to first. And timeout was called before the pitch. Well, Pudge Rodriguez did not want him to throw that pitch, and so he called timeout. And out comes Joe Torre because Joe Torre is going to say you can't call timeout when the pitcher is already in his motion. Now, see, you see Rodriguez asking for timeout, but Burkett has already started his motion toward the plate. See, he looks away, and he starts his motion. See, he never starts, sees Rodriguez until he starts to the plate. And Joe Torre is saying you cannot call timeout when the pitcher is already in his with his delivery to the plate, because that would have been ball one, obviously. Well, Joe's not going to win the argument, and and you're right. With with Burkett pitching out of the stretch, once he got his sign from Rodriguez, he was checking Williams at third, and that's when Rodriguez stuck the hand up to call time with Jim Evans. strike one to Jeter. Action in the Texas bullpen. But Oates sticks with Burkett in the sixth. High one and one. Cohn hoping his teammates can bail him out. Not at his best tonight. Two and one. Remember before the game when we were talking with Joe Torre and he talked about how important this game was tonight to the Yankees? Playing two here and then going to the ballpark in Arlington for the next three if need be. And they have played very, very badly in Texas, the Yankees. 
Corey said this was almost a must win in game one. Well, Texas won seven of 12 from the Yankees this year, but they took five of six at home against New York. Slice foul. Well, the Yankees have lost 14 of their last 17. 33 of their last 41 in Texas. Here's that last hack by Jeter. It's that line drive into the lower seats and right. Here it is again. It pitched a hit. A little bit tardy. Lines it foul. Bases loaded, two out. And the 2-2 pitch. And a little pop to the right side. They'll leave three. Clark squeezes it. Burkett tiptoes through a minefield in the sixth. And still leads six to two. David Cohn's night is over. And the look on his face tells you how he feels about it. It started out as if he would be in a groove. He looked very sharp through the first three. Then it came apart in the fourth, and he struggled after that. Center fielder, Darryl Hamilton. Well, here's the guy that Bob was talking about earlier. The uh, much maligned Graham Lloyd, who has uh, really been taken apart by, uh, by the Yankee fans and the Yankee press. And talking about press, he hasn't been that impressive since being here, but this guy can get out left-handed. A tough play, but over to cover is Lloyd. And Hamilton is out. Hamilton worked out before this season with Olympians Carl Lewis and Leroy Burrell. Neither one of those guys can hit, but they can <laughs> run. Well, he almost made it to the tape before Lloyd here, but not quite. <laughs> now he's, I'll tell you what, Daryl Hamilton and watching him in his career with Milwaukee has always been a he's always been a good player. He bulked himself up a little bit to, and, and, and really went to Texas with that in mind to, to, to put himself in position to be on a championship club, and that's what's happened with him this year. I'm happy for him. Rodriguez one for three. problem that Lloyd had after he came over here, Bob, was his inability to throw a curveball, he said, because of a, a little bone spur in his elbow. But uh, he, he throws a cut fastball. He's got a good slider. And, uh, and as I said before, he's, uh, he can get left-handers out. And, and without the problem, I mean, he's been a good pitcher. You saw his season numbers first, but pop that back up there if you can. These are the numbers in his short stint with the Yankees in five and two-thirds innings. He's allowed 11 runs. Those are the kind of numbers that mock you from the back of a baseball card. Off-speed pitch roll to second. Duncan's got it. A reminder about tomorrow night on NBC. Wings, Lara Kett. News Radio, Men Behaving Badly. Must see TV, a night of comedy on NBC. Four heavy hitters in the Wednesday lineup. It is widely believed, and this isn't our opinion, we're just reporting the speculation around New York, that despite the fact that the Yankees have won the division and George Steinbrenner is pleased with Joe Torre, he is not pleased with his general manager, Bob Watson. Although Watson had a hand in some of the acquisitions which were important in building this club into a winner. The Milwaukee transaction particularly peeves the Yankee owner. Pat Listash comes over, broken foot. Lloyd comes over, ineffective. There's going to be a hearing about the validity of the trade. The Brewers contend that they didn't knowingly send damaged goods the Yankees' way. And it's believed, again, this is speculation, that unless the Yankees prevail in the hearing, or unless they go all the way and win the World Series, that in spite of everything, Watson's job is in jeopardy. Well, Lloyd is going to record a 1-2-3 inning, and I'm not so sure that's happened. Well, he's been wearing pinstripes. He's got to feel a bit better. Stretch time on the Bronx. NBC 
NBC's coverage of tonight's Division Series game is brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest-lasting trucks on the road. By Gatorade Thirst Quencher, because every athlete has the right to be quenched. Life is a sport. Drink it up. By Long Kiss Goodnight, starring Gina Davis and Samuel L. Jackson, rated R. And by United Airlines and its more than 50,000 employee owners. Come fly our friendly skies. Shot from the Goodyear blimp. And inside Yankee Stadium, a crowd of better than 57,000. In fact, it's the largest crowd since Yankee Stadium was renovated. It used to seat better than 60,000. And they pack all the standing room folks in on those October days for the World Series in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Reigns lifts one to right on the first pitch here in the bottom of the seventh. Gonzalez has it lined up. Since we mentioned the blimp, we might as well mention its occupant. For occupants, we have only one name. The captain is Dan Thomas. I assume he's ably he assisted, help, he? but the names of his colleagues are not on this sheet. Don Zimmer. <laughs> Bounce foul, and Jose Cardinal with a nice play. Tosses it into the seats. Every one of Joe Torre's coaches, Chris Chambliss, Tony Kloniger, Jose Cardinal, Mel Stottlemyre, Willie Randolph, Don Zimmer, every one of them has played in the World Series. Corey never did. How about Joe talking Zimmer into coming back this year? Look, uh, He left the Rockies last year. There he is. Look at Zim. <laughs> 47 years of baseball etched on that face. Going back to 1949. Bonds. In the air to left, and Greer comes in to make the catch for the second out. You look at Joe Torrey's career. Here's a guy who's been around the majors since 1960. Nine times an All-Star, an MVP, a batting champion. He caught Warren Spahn's 300th victory. He's managed four teams. He's been involved in over 4,000 Major League games as a player or a manager. He even roomed with Bob Euchre, and despite all that, mm -hmm. he's never been in the World Series. Yep. This could be the year. Yep, you're right. Maybe because of the last item, he's never been in a World Series. <laughs> There's an influence there that's difficult to shake. I remember when I got traded back to Atlanta, and Joe was catching there, and he suffered some torn ligaments in his foot, and I had to catch every day. I mean, I couldn't believe this guy would walk around with a cast for, a, for like a week. I mean, just torn ligaments. Every day I go up there and say, are you going to play or not? You know, I said, you know, the more I play, the closer I'm going back to the minor leagues. Take that thing <laughs> off. 1-1 one, one pitch coming to O'Neill. Burkett, who survived a shaky sixth, now on the verge of completing a quick seventh. Cohn briefly retreated to the clubhouse, but he comes back out now to watch. Retreating from shortstop is Elster, and he'll make the catch. That's typical of Cohn, by the way. Even when he was hurt and on the disabled list, he spent a lot of time around the club. His teammates respect him for that. He's not going to bail on them. Right now on the short end of a 6-2 score. The day of divisional playoffs began at Camden Yards in Baltimore. The Orioles, the wild card team, jumping on the American League favorites, the Indians, 10-4. Sorhoff a pair of solos, Bonilla a grand slam, Brady Anderson a leadoff homer off loser Charles Nagy in the bottom of the first. David Wells was the winner. And then in St. Louis, a three-run homer by Gary Gaetti in the first inning was all the Cardinals needed. Todd Stottlemyre the winner, Eckersley the save, and St. Louis takes a 1-0 lead. The lineup tomorrow, Joe Morgan on short sleep, works with John Miller, one Eastern time from Camden Yards. The Dodgers and the Braves get started, also on ESPN, 4 Eastern. And then back out here for game two, Andy Pettit, the left-hander, who won 21 against 16-game winner for Texas, the right-hander Ken Hill. And you can see that game brought to you by our friends at Fox TV tomorrow night. You know, talking about Brady Anderson, back in the second inning, 
<laughs> is that what it was? <laughs> we're you know, talking it, about all the home runs. It, That's what we were talking about. It occurs to me you can't follow the playoffs without a scorecard and a TV guide. That's right. There's David Weathers. He's the new Yankee pitcher. And I was talking about Anderson. We were talking about his 50 home runs. Only 19 came at Oriole Park. Supposedly a hitter's paradise. Gonzalez skies one to center. And Bernie Williams takes care of it. So Graham Lloyd worked one inning I in relief you. of Cone, a perfect inning, and that's important just as a confidence builder. I mean, this guy had just been walloped. There he is, native of Australia. And to retire three straight batters, whether or not it has an effect on this game, since they trail 6-2, to two, is less important than whether it gets his gets him into some kind of groove and gets his head in order. You're right, Bob. He, he, I mean, he's, he's a guy that's very conscientious. He knows he can pitch here, and uh, and and as I said before, he did a good job for the Brewers, and, and uh, the deal that sent him to New York was going to put him in postseason play. He was happy about that. It just didn't work out early enough. That's all. He's doing all right. He'll pitch all right in the series. So now it's the 27-year-old right-hander David Weathers, a Tennessee native, former Florida Marlin. doesn't look as if Joe Torrey is going to be able to call upon Rivera or Wetland, which has been the key to victory for the Yankees this year. Trailing now 6-2. to two. The Yankees have been very successful throughout the year in making it a sixth or seventh inning ball game if they could get the lead because then they bring on Rivera for two and Wetland for the final three outs. Another chance for Williams. Back to the edge of the track for out number two. Sir John Wetland leaning for a guy known as Psycho to his teammates. He looks rather serene there. <laughs> he might be chained. In a sense, a typical night for Tettleton. He hasn't put the ball in play. He struck out twice and walked. And he's usually around 100 in both those categories for a season. Throw in 24 homers and 83 RBIs. We're in the eighth. 6-2 Texas. You know, no matter where this guy's played, though, Bob, Nobody's ever accused him of, of, of not going out all out all the time. I mean, as a catcher, first baseman, he's played in the outfield. I mean, he's, he's taken a beating from time to time. But uh, year in and year out, I mean, he still puts up some decent numbers. The combination of the presence of Ivan Rodriguez, who started 130 games behind the plate and came into 17 more as a catcher this year, mm -hmm. the combination of that and his knee problems have pretty much eliminated Tettleton as a catcher. Played some outfield in the past. Mostly DHing these days. Caught in only three games this year. And he'll sit down. As Weathers, as did Lloyd before him, comes in to work a perfect inning of relief. Hits are even, the runs are not because two of the Texas hits are home runs. Gonzalez and Palmer in that five-run fourth. John Burkett, who has pitched two complete games this year, one for the Marlins, and one of his 10 regular season starts with the Rangers, works into the eighth. And as you see, still eight shy of 100 pitches. And what control? He's walked only one. He struck out seven. And the seven strikeouts is unusual simply because he's a sinker ball pitcher and he likes to get the ground balls rather than the strikeouts. 22 and seven for the Giants in 1993 when they lost that heartbreaking race to the Braves in the West. Booted by Clark. Does he have time to recover? He does. With Burkett getting over there ahead of Bernie Williams. One out of the eighth. Bob, I don't think we've given enough credit to Johnny Oates for orchestrating this victory or the division winning for the Texas Rangers. We see this jam job on Bernie Williams. He starts out of the batter's box slowly. Will Clark just fumbles it. 
doesn't panic, picks it up. Good play by John Burkett to get over there and wait for him. Tino Martinez. You were starting to say about... Yeah, Johnny Oates orchestrated this divisional title from spring training. He started by going to Gonzalez and saying, I want to move you to right field from left field, which will help their defense. He also talked about getting starting pitching and playing better defense. And that's the strength of this ball club, their starting pitching and their defense. And he also did another thing I think is very important. In the past, people think that Texas has wilted under the heat down the stretch each year. They've had leads and not been able to hold them. Well, this year he went to a different routine. He only put his players on the field after June for 20 minutes a day before the game. They could go out and take 10 minutes of ground ball or take 10 minutes of hitting, but he didn't want them out there in the hot sun more than 20 minutes a day. This could be the third hit for Martinez. It's headed for the gap. Greer can't cut it off. Martinez chugs into second with his second double of the night. Throw in a single, and he's three for four. More time it looked like a high fastball from Burkett and Martinez who doubled back in the fourth he hit one up along the third baseline for a double sends this one to the gap Greer can't get to it and Hamilton finally runs it down you know Martinez a one-out double Texas bullpen is busy well at least Evans is consistent. He gave Strawberry time out there after Burkett had started to the plate. Strawberry 0 for 3. Hit the ball hard one time. A hooking liner into the corner and right that Gonzalez caught up with. The other two times he's fanned. Once called, once swinging. strike out the last time in the sixth Williams and Martinez opened the inning with hits the Yankees had runners at first and third with nobody out and Strawberry struck out then Duncan fan and after Girardi walked to load the bases Jeter popped up and Burkett squirmed out of it he made a heck of a pitch on Jeter in that inning jammed him for the pop-up and here in the eighth just jammed strawberry a broken bat job He's done a good job inside breaking stuff too far inside two and one little slider again though he got bernie williams on a jam job ground ball the first to open the inning the string on him two and two and that has been the pitch that he has used to set strawberry up for the fastball to get him out each time this is a beautiful change up and strawberry way out in front now he's always followed this with a good hard fastball there's another one didn't get that one up or in like he wanted but he always comes off of that change up with a fastball you know Joe you said earlier that, that Johnny Oates would really be happy if Burkett got him to the seventh tonight. He's done that and more. Right. But, you know, a manager gets greedy. He just wants two more now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he's throwing well. He's doing all right. <laughs> There's that little Taylor. Almost. Boy, how many times do you give up on that as a hitter? You see that ball coming inside. No matter how many times you face a guy, you still give up on it. Full count to Strawberry. Martinez at second. One out of the eighth. Yanks down four. And he gets a little piece of it. Another changeup. Mm -hmm. There's a 3-2 changeup he threw in. It's unusual with a four-run lead. Say, so, well, I can't walk anyone, but you can see that he takes a little bit off here. There's that changeup. And Strawberry a little bit out in front. Still a dynamic figure at the plate, Darryl Strawberry. A ballpark still buzzes when he strides into the box. Definitely gets your attention. This ball is 
laced to center, but right at Hamilton. Well, Darrell has struck out twice tonight and lined out hard to the outfield twice. Folks, NBC Sports is online at www.com slash sports. All the news from the NFL, Notre Dame football, and the baseball playoffs, plus the best golf site on the internet and more at www.com slash sports. Are you on that World Wide Web, you? Yeah, I am, as a matter oh, of yeah. fact. Yeah. Figured you were. Get in that chat room, visit with some of your fans. You spin it, I'll jump in it. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Duncan. Roll to the right side. Merkin nurses the lead through eight. Still six to Texas. Weathers back to work for his second inning in the top of the ninth. Dean Palmer is two for three, a single and a two-run homer. As you may know, he missed most of 95 with a ruptured tendon in his right bicep. He's come back this year to hit 38 homers and drive in 107. And they wondered in the offseason, since they were reasonably close in 95 in the West, what they might have done had he been there. Yep. Of course, up in Seattle this year, they can't help but regret the injury to Randy Johnson. You have to believe that they could have taken it to the wire or maybe outdone the Rangers if Johnson had been there True. all year long. They came close as it was. Lost Russell Davis for most of the year. The outstanding third baseman that they acquired from the Yankees. I mean, a guy they had really counted on. He's out for the, uh, for the major portion of the year. Even with all the offense in baseball, American League in particular, I don't think anybody sends four hitters at you, like Alex Rodriguez, mm -hmm. Edgar Martinez, Jay Buter, and Ken Griffey Jr. Yep. Palmer goes down on strikes. NBC's coverage of tonight's Division Series game is brought to you by the men and women of General Motors. People in motion. By UPS, moving at the speed of business by MetLife, get met, it pays. And by Goodyear, number one in tires. Well, Cone fanned eight while he was in there. Weathers has added two more. And it's nothing unusual for Rangers to go down on strikes in double figures on any given day or night. stuff about strikeouts is ancient history in today's game. I mean, yeah. it, you know, you got guys like like this Texas ball club or Paul Lamore for that matter. Guys are going to go up there and strike out and, and hit you 35, 40, 45 home runs a year. Who cares about strikeouts? Bernie Williams has had a busy night. Into left center he goes to tuck it away. A reminder again about tomorrow night on NBC. A must-see Wednesday of comedy. Wings, Lara Kett, News Radio, and Men so Behaving Badly. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I was leaving the punchline to you. I just think. left it hanging there like a big fat curveball, yeah, and you I just, just watched it. Uh, swing and a miss. <laughs> curveball, you mentioned bad words. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a bit outside. <laughs> a bit outside. <laughs> there could be a three coming up. Depends on the Indians. <laughs> Elster hits it hard, but Jeter's got it. And we go to the bottom of the ninth. Let's see if Burkett comes out to try for the complete game. We'll be back to the Bronx. Last licks for the Yankees when we return. The key innings for John Burkett were the first and the sixth. The Yankees had second and third nobody out, first and third nobody out in those two innings, and just one run to show for it. Golden opportunities largely wasted. Thanks to a great play by uh, Dean Palmer in the opening inning on that backhanded stab of the ball hit by, uh, by O'Neill that would have scored at least one, possibly two, 
and O'Neill ends up with a double and nobody out, but Palmer made a heck of a play. Huge night for Palmer, the big defensive play and the two-run homer. Well, the Yankees script calls for getting into both bullpens. Theirs, which is strong, and Texas's, which is relatively weak. It hasn't happened that way. No Rivera, no Wetland, because Texas has had the lead since the fourth. Burkett on the verge of a complete game. To his left, Elster scoops it up and throws Girardi out. One out on the ninth. And if you're the Texas Rangers, you have to feel very good about yourself if you can win tonight's ball game. And forgetting about tomorrow, obviously they're going to try to win tomorrow, but they have the second best record in the American League at home. I mean, they're going home. They're 50 and 31 at home. Cleveland was 51 and 29, but they have the best record other than Cleveland in the league. So if you can go home, even with a split, you figure you can win two out of three at home. Andy Pettit, 13 and 3 this year after a Yankee defeat. But I was looking at some other notes. They're going to have to handle Gonzalez tomorrow because he hit 376 against left-handed pitching. I mean, unbelievable. This team, the right-handers on the Texas Rangers hit left-handed pitching well because they're not all pull hitters, and they stay out left center to right center. So Pettit's going to have his work cut out for him. One and one to Derek Jeter, who's 0 for 3, and he stranded six runners tonight. Left the bases loaded to conclude the sixth. Play behind the Yankee dugout, one and two. Burkett started this inning having thrown 105 pitches. He's made some great pitches inside today, yes. Bob. He really has. He did it on Jeter back in the sixth. And here again, this looked like a breaking ball or that cut fastball. And it was in tight on Jeter, and he fought it off, fouled it back. But he's made some really quality pitches. He really has. Watch Rodriguez set up outside. Two and two. Obviously, any postseason game is crucial, but in a best-of-five series, that first game takes on added importance, especially if you lose it at home, where you have only two, and the other team has potentially three at home, and they're a team that has dominated you so consistently in their ballpark, as the Rangers have the Yankees. This is a huge defeat for the Yanks, mm -hmm. assuming Burkett holds on. Well, that's what Joe Torre said before the game tonight. This was a very, very big game for the Yankees. You know, if they, they get out of here one, one apiece, I know Joe Torre is going to be awfully happy, but to take this opening game, the Yankees are saying, you know, hooray, we take game two tomorrow, and there's Andy Pettit. He'll pitch tomorrow's game. Uh, you get out of here 2-0, and oh, go to Texas, and take your chances. But out of here 1-1, one and one, as you said, Bob, going down there where they've had problems, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Look out. Just behind the camera well there, people sent scattering. Well, the Yankees left New York up 2-0 in the division series last year, went to Seattle, and in that scintillating series, lost three straight at the Kingdom. It was a great series, too. It was a, it was a thrilling series, despite the losers. Uh, losers uh, Seattle, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I never saw anything like that in Seattle. In all those years, Bob, when we were up there last year, uh, in all the years that I've watched baseball in the Kingdom, never anything like that. Long night for Derek Jeter. Well, last year, I think the Mariners were kind of like a Cinderella team. And truthfully, the Texas team has taken on that type of an air this year because they figure like they're the underdog. Bounce toward the middle and through. So that's some consolation for him. Well, it doesn't help him leaving all those runners on base tonight, but it will help him for tomorrow at least he'll come out feeling like well I've got it solved I know the problems I was having first couple of innings but that pitch is down and away and he grounds it back through the middle he's had problems with the ball inside tonight that one's out over the plate first hit of the night but the first time he has batted with no one on base the Yankees about hit the Rangers tonight 10-8 but trails 6-2 
plate with one out. Boggs next. They need to put a couple of men on base and then give the likes of O'Neill and Williams a crack at it. A couple more men on base in addition to Jeter. Another pitch inside from Burkett. Such a tough ball to hit fair unless you, you flare one someplace. I mean, if you get out in front of it, you're going to hit it foul. It's, it's a tough pitch to hit fair to right. Watch it again. Here it is. Inside. And it, you get out in front of it. You want to get out in front of it. You don't want him to throw it by you. And it's tough to keep it fair. One and two to Reigns, who's one for four on the night. Paul O'Neill hoping to get another shot here. He's in the hole with Boggs on deck. To his left is McLemore with a nice play, and from the outfield grass, he retires Reigns. The Yankees are down to their last out. Another good sinker inside, and he jams Reigns and allows McLemore time to run it down. The ball's inside, so he breaks his bat. And it's not hit hard enough to get through the infield. It allowed McLemore time to run it down. Nice play by Mark. Good hustle by Mark. Takes his time, lines it up, and throws Reigns out at first base. Again, this is a very good defensive team Texas puts on the field. A strike to Boggs, who doubled his first time and has been retired three times since. Struck him out in the fifth. He took two and then swung at a fastball and missed it. Left field, Rusty Greer says, I'll take it, and that'll do it. If this goes five, Burkett and Cohn will hook up again in the decider. But tonight, Burkett has by far the better of it. Goes the distance. Wins it 6-2 to two with home run support from Juan Gonzalez and Dean Palmer. And Texas comes into New York to capture game one. They play Frank Sinatra at much lower decibels following a defeat. So very faintly in the background. The chairman of the board. Serenading the folks out of the ballpark in the Bronx. Tonight's genuine Chevrolet player of the game is, of course, John Burkett. He's with Jim Gray. Jim? All right, thank you very much, Bob. John, you had a couple of jams tonight. Tell us about the one in the first inning, and things really could have gotten away from you. Yeah, that was, that was a big key. I mean, we had second and third, nobody out, and then Dean Palmer made that great play. And uh, after that, I just said, hey, man, settle down, maybe give up one, and... Uh, yeah, you know, just damage control, and uh, he was a big part of that. And then the sixth inning, basically the same situation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we had first and third, and no out. I, yeah, and again, you know, when you're in that situation, you just try to get an out. You know, that's what I think about. If I give up one, that's okay, but it, but uh, I just wanted to keep them from getting two or three or a big inning. You know? John, this is an awful big win for you guys. You now want to come in here with the split. You got a chance to get away here from two. Yeah, I mean, the, the first game is big. You know, if you can get that one, then uh, you know now we can look at getting tomorrow's game. And if not, we got to split and we go home and, and uh, with our fans and see what happens. John, congratulations. Okay, Great game you. tonight. Thanks. All right, Bob, we send it back upstairs to you. All right, Jim, thanks a lot. John Burkett reputed to be unflappable, and he proved it tonight. And this is his first ever playoff appearance. He goes the distance in front of a raucous crowd at Yankee Stadium. Now, don't forget, NBC's coverage of the playoffs continues this Friday in primetime, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. These same two teams in game three from the ballpark in Arlington. That's Friday in primetime, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC. Now, for most of you, stay tuned for your late local news, followed by The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Among Jay's guests tonight from Baywatch, David Hasselhoff. For Bob Uecker and Joe Morgan, I'm Bob Costas. So long from Yankee Stadium.